Game 840 here. So there's a terrific expose of the Stanford University professor and health podcasting crank Charlotte and Andrew Huberman. So he's been a frequent uh, target of this show. He just consistently dishes out uh, completely bogus advice. The Huberman lab that he's always talking about, turns out nothing's been going on there for months, if not years. And uh, terrific expose in New York Magazine and followed up with articles on uh, Slate and other publications. But uh, people like Andrew Huberman, I mean, Lex Friedman, Joe Rogan, I mean, these are Oprah-level purveyors of uh, discourse and information. I mean, just terrible sources of wisdom. And yet Andrew Huberman, you know, wrapping himself in the mantle of Stanford University, has transformed himself into the number one health and fitness podcast. But if you look to someone like Huberman for your health and fitness advice, all right, you're looking in a terrible place. So I just want to play a few little excerpts here from uh, New York Magazine. It's articles written by Kerry Howley, who I interviewed on my blog about uh, 20 years ago. She's She was a regular on Greg Gutfeld's Red Eye program on Fox News back in, what, 2005, 2007. And extremely ambitious. He gave the impression of working on himself. Throughout their relationship, he would talk about repair and healthy merging. He was devoted to his bull mastiff, Costello, whom he worried over constantly. Was Costello comfortable, sleeping he properly? Was devoted. Andrew liked to dote on the dog, she says, and he liked to be doted on by Sarah. I was never sitting around him, she says. She cooked for him and felt glad when he relished what she had made. Sarah was willing to have unprotected sex because she believed they were monogamous. On Thanksgiving in 2018, Sarah planned to introduce Andrew to her parents and close friends. She was cooking. Andrew texted repeatedly to say he would be late, then later. According to a friend, he was just, oh yeah, I'll be there. Oh, I'm going to be running hours late. And then, of course, all of these things were planned around his arrival, and he just kept going, oh, I'm going to be late. And then it's the end of the night, and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, this and this happened. Huberman disappearing was something of a pattern. Friends, girlfriends, and colleagues describe him as hard to reach. The list of reasons for not showing up included a book, time-stamping the podcast, Costello, wildfires, and a meetings tunnel. He is flaky and doesn't respond to things, says his friend Brian McKenzie. A ha I, being reliable is about the most important trait that is not obvious among people. Like, we need... We need reliability or we're, we're immersed in, in chaos and it just creates tremendous anxiety. So unreliable people in your life are incredibly destructive, all right? So you're disrupting, you're destroying, you're damaging, right? You're making life so much more difficult and unpleasant for, for people around you if you're unreliable. So it's not like this is some kind of trivial matter. Health influencer who has collaborated with him on breathing protocols. And if you can't handle that, Andrew definitely is not somebody you want to be close to. Look, I, I, most of my friends are married with kids. So I recognize if you have a family, if you have like a, a demanding job, right, you have a demanding position in the community. I understand there, there are going to be all sorts of higher priorities than... Uh, say, getting together with coffee for you. So I understand those things. But above and beyond those type of obvious commitments where, yeah, you would expect someone to put their family first and in some cases to put their job first or their communal responsibilities first. After that, if someone's constantly flaking on you because they're carrying on all these hidden sexual affairs, that, that's, not the, uh, that's not the real problem. That's just the symptom of a deeper problem. This is someone who is causing chaos in... A large number of lives and you don't want people like that around so whatever happened to candace owens so you're talking like ben shapiro dennis prager joe rogan andrew huberman tier uh, content creators right we're talking about people who've built enormous audiences telling people what they they want to hear but not not people who are serious intellectuals so i mean candace owens is provocative uh and She's sometimes brave and uh, just just frequently uh, 
um, uh, bizarre, right? I, I mean, who really expects uh, great, great wisdom from from Candace Owens? I mean, sometimes she, she brings it, right? But uh, like many people of her level. I never shared and I want to share today was what happened thereafter. A friend of mine who I am not going to name encouraged me to visit the Simon Wiesenthal Center. That's a human rights organization, human rights for Jews organization. And there was this very strange meeting that occurred. And I want to be clear that I didn't understand the meeting because the individuals were speaking in Hebrew. My understanding going into it was that once I spoke to this individual, things would be clarified and then I could just go on living and my reputation would pretty much be restored. And by golly, that's kind of what happened. So again, it was an extremely old man. I I think he runs the place. I don't know. I can't remember his name, so I'm not going to make one up. But I had to sit in a meeting and explain that I didn't think Hitler was a great person, listen to two people speak Hebrew, and then my reputation was restored. Or at least I was allowed to go on pursuing what I wanted to pursue, which was just talking about black. So people will will take whatever power and influence they have over you that they can, right? Whether it's a 13-year-old girl, whether it's your boss, whether it's your secretary, whether it's a stranger on the street. Like people love to wield power over other people, right? Rabbi Marvin Heyer and the Simon Wiesenthal Center are not some strange outliers here. So Newsweek magazine has described Rabbi Marvin Heyer as the most influential, most powerful rabbi, number one rabbi in America. He he is like the Al Sharpton of the Jews, except he does everything at a much higher level and a, a more effective level. So the Simon Wiesenthal Center and Rabbi Marvin Heyer, they have tremendous influence among those people who, you know, want to buy into their shtick. All right. He's, he's a, essentially a race hustler, a tolerance hustler, and uh, he's found a very lucrative niche. All right. If you tell any group that they're oppressed and that you're going to fight for them against their oppressors, right, you're going to find a ready-made audience, right? Because you can't have any kind of in-group identity without simultaneously feeling oppressed and victimized. And so Rabbi Marvin Heyer is very good at what he does, but uh, good on Candace Owens for not buying into it. Americans and the fracturing of the black and white relationship. It's a very odd thing when I reflect on that. But I want to be clear that the threats, the threats that Candace, this could be over at any moment for you, don't you get out of line again by, you know, saying something that you never actually said, but don't make us have to threaten you again. That I still always felt over me because it was just a very scary thing to go through. Okay, you're going to feel that over you if you're weak, right? People will wield all the power they can over you, whether it's a boss, it's a secretary, a stranger, all right? You you don't have to buy into it. Uh, I remember when I was making my journey into Judaism, uh, people would try to take advantage of my naivete and my anxiety and my insecurity all the time. And then when I developed a sense of self and I started fighting back, such as uh, on my blog, uh, people didn't stop messing with me. So you will be victimized essentially to the extent that you allow yourself to be victimized. Right? Uh, Marvin Heyer and the Simon Wiesenthal Center do not wield huge influence except for those who want to buy into that. And so there are all kind of ethnic hustlers, religious hustlers, tolerance hustlers, politically correct hustlers. Uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center simply plays the game more effectively than almost everybody else. But just like the, the Southern Poverty Law Center, okay, they, they have enormous you know, financial assets behind them. Uh, but you don't have to go around like a victim. right? Uh, there's no point in making unnecessary enemies in life. Right? You want to have the best possible relations with everyone that you possibly can, including the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Southern Poverty Law Center, but it doesn't mean you need to sacrifice your integrity. So, world's number one rabbi. Well, Newsweek named him the, the number one rabbi in America. Yeah, for Jews that take Judaism seriously, people who simply you know, peddle the, the great threat of the Cossacks and anti-Semitism right, are not taken seriously. All right, uh, the Simon Wiesenthal Center shtick, the Anti-Defamation League shtick, that is a way along with like human rights obsessions, that's a way for people to feel something 
given that uh, their, their ordinary commitments to left to center politics have proved frustrating. So the, the great obsession with human rights in the 1970s came about because all sorts of people on the left found Marxism ultimately empty and unsatisfying, and they needed some other kind of virtuous crusade. And so whether it's human rights or fighting anti-Semitism or fighting racism or fighting bigotry, it's a way to feel something, to feel virtuous, and to try to carve out a, a public and prosperous and esteemed prestigious role for yourself. But you're only going to carve out a prestigious role for yourself with people who buy into your, your hustle. So if you, if you don't buy into that hustle, all right, you're going to have, have contempt for, for people like this. And uh, these, these uh, you know, hustlers like uh, Southern Poverty Law Center and Simon Wiesenthal Center, et cetera, uh, frequently they deserve contempt. And then sometimes they do good work, right? You, you frequently learn more from your enemy than from your friends. Yeah, Luke Ford's platforming of Nick Fuentes was a springboard to to Nick's <laughs> mainstream, mainstream success. Okay, uh, any more good clips of uh, Candace Owens? He in some ways disappeared, says David Spiegel, a Stanford psychiatrist who calls Andrew prodigiously smart and intensely engaging. I mean, I recently got a really nice email from him, which I was touched by. I really was. In 2018, before he was famous, Huberman invited a Colorado-based investigative journalist and anthropologist, Scott Carney, to his home in Oakland for a few days. The two would go camping and discuss their mutual interest in actionable science. It had been Huberman, a fan of Carney's book, What Doesn't Kill Us, who initially reached out. Okay, so the, the people that we love and venerate and listen to, they, they say a great deal about us. I mean, Huberman was obviously... A considerable element of a shyster and con man from, from day one. And if you, you know, you bought into his shtick, it, it shows a certain you know, willful naivete on, on your part. So here's more Candace Owen clips. I don't get to tell a black man if he's experiencing racism. Mm -hmm. He knows. I don't get to tell you if you're experiencing misogyny. You know. If I make a comment and it's misogynistic, and you say, Rabbi, you know that was really misogynistic, my job is to say, wow, I didn't mean that. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. It, it, in some circumstances, that's the most adaptive way, way to go. But th there's nothing you know, passed on from heaven that, that dictates this is the way to go. This is, the Torah doesn't say this is the way to go. Right? It's not like certain groups, blacks, Jews, women, trans, homosexuals, get uh, veto power over public speech. <laughs> Jews get to tell us. That was anti-Semitic. Yeah, every group is going to try to work the, their victimhood angle if that's an effective angle to work. Like I use shtick, right? I use a little bit of uh, regional Australia, uh, Australia bro shtick because I, I find it frequently an effective way to navigate through life. And people who invoke the evils of anti-Semitism or, or racism or homophobia or bigotry, they do that because they get rewarded for doing so. But if, if you choose not to buy into their shtick, then it should have you know, limited power over you. Your job is to say, now you say, I'm sorry, Rabbi. Now say it. Say, I'm sorry, Rabbi. You can't tell me what it is. I said it was anti-Semitic and you hurt me. Now say, I'm sorry, Rabbi. <laughs> That's your job. Now say it. <laughs> say it, Goyo. That's not. And so what did Candace Owens say? I mean, she says a lot of crazy things. I mean, she is someone who pushes buttons and she, you know, appeals to a low IQ audience like Ben Shapiro. And th these, are, these are people who become successful telling, you know, millions of Americans what they want to hear. And Candace Owens is unpredictable, right? You, you just never know where, where she's going to go with things. Not what I meant. <laughs> and you, you and do not get the right. Okay, hang on a second. And the two became friendly over phone and email. Huberman confirmed Carney's list of camping gear, sleeping bag, bug spray, boots. When Carney got there, the two 
did not go camping. Huberman simply disappeared for most of a day and a half while Carney stayed home with Costello. He puttered around Huberman's place, buying a juice, walking through the neighborhood, waiting for him to return. It was a- Whoa, I have to take it all back, guys. That was the, that was the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and I, I just, I, I've gone wrong. I've, I've, I've taken a bad, bad path there. The, the power to destroy me, I, I, need to, I need to take you know, everything back now. Yeah, people respond to incentives, right? That's just as, just as true for, for uh, Candace Owens and, uh, and everybody else. So, I, I mean, there's just a low, you know, low level of uh, punditry out there that's simply, you know, not, not worth paying that much attention. So... Is kind of trillions funny. of dollars you're, you're you're signing these omnibus bills if you read into it where that where that money is going it's insane it's it's mm-hmm. literally going you know to museums boards of museums they're quite literally money laundering is what's happening when they sign these bills but they keep it so that the information level is so low for americans that it's like oh covid's so bad like we're going to give you a check that's like you know three hundred dollars this basically describes welfareism, right? Like, despite the fact that there's been trillions of dollars since um, the establishment of welfare, black Americans are poorer today than we were before it. People don't know this, but during the time of Jim Crow, before welfare was established in the 1950s. Okay, so uh, Candace Owens found, found a niche telling, telling an audience, you know, really harsh, <laughs> harsh uh, critical comments about black Americans. There's an enormous audience for that, and she fills up that role pretty well. Okay, here's more from uh, But anybody Nick. who was in my inner circle can attest that in the opening weeks of Yay 24, I was distraught. I talked to Candace Owens about this. I talked to classical theist about this. I talked to everybody around me. I said, I don't know what to do. This guy's a psycho. This guy is pure evil. I want nothing to do with him. But yet, you know, I, I can't really... I'm, I'm in this bad situation where now I'm on a team. It's not like the same thing when you're in control. When you're on a team, you can't really call the shots. Also, if I were to leave very publicly, it's going to look bad on Yay. It's going to look bad on me. So anyway, it was a tough thing to navigate, but I think that God created a path. But anybody who was in my inner circle... But I said, look, dude, I'm like, here's the problem. Yay, you want to have it both ways. Like... You want to enjoy the privilege of being a minority, but also the privilege of being a majority. I'm like, maybe you should just have respect for the fact that you're not American and butt out. Like, where's the respect? Where's the due consideration and respect to say, hey, I'm not home. I'm a foreigner. Therefore, I am not entitled to. Well, Jew, Jews, uh, blacks, uh, whatever outgroup uh, may or may not be. Some of them may or may not be foreigners in America, but many of them being here for many, many generations. So you can't just say like Jews are, are foreigners in America. So most Jews in America are highly assimilated. And the, the Jewish question, the question of whether Jews can be full citizens of a host country, all right, that was often debated in Europe in the 19th century. Very few people are going to debate that today. Right? There, there's not this large audience questioning um, wh- whether you know Jews can be full Americans or full Germans, very few people have that concern anymore. All right here's uh, Candace Owens with the Daily Wire a couple of weeks ago. So when I'm walking mm-hmm. through Jerusalem and you see, and they say these are the Muslim quarters, this is where the Muslims are right. allowed to live. That doesn't mm-hmm. feel like a bastion of freedom to me. Um, so wait, there, there are Jewish Jewish quarters in uh, every you know major city in the United States. There are Jewish neighborhoods. So it's not like uh, Muslims are only allowed to live in, in certain sectors, right? They're, they're free to live in the overwhelming majority of Israel. Like 95% of Israel, right, Muslims are welcome to live there. I, I guess. Oh, I, I don't think it's where they're allowed to live in Jerusalem. I think it's that there are, there's an Armenian quarter. It's not saying the Armenians can only live here. It's that there are communities just like there's a... Right, so Candace Owens just doesn't know very much. But she is brave, and so sometimes she says some brave things, and frequently she says a lot of dumb things. A Jewish community in in Jersey here, and there's a Muslim community in here. I don't think you know. 
to my understanding, it's not restrictions within Israel proper of where I, I Israeli think it is where they ha- I think but, it is where they have. I mean, at least that's what the rabbi who was taking me around. He said these are the Muslim quarters, so this is where the Muslims live. But I, he didn't say anything about legally saying they cannot live on other places within Israel proper. I mean, there's Israeli Arab citizens. That- so when I'm walking mm-hmm. through Jerusalem. Okay, so Candace Owens. Here she says, Israel controls conservative media. Let's hear this. Take somebody out and their entire career, because what it registers to me as is power. Real power hiding behind a veneer of victimhood, the kind of power that can take somebody out and their entire career if that person says something that they don't like. And in this case, it's not that I'm saying things that they don't like. It's that I'm refusing to allow my voice to be controlled. I want to be clear to you guys. I'm going to be honest with you because everybody's noticing it. Every single political commentator in America, every single one of them knows this, that if you do not step out and say things that are radically pro-Israel, or if you are too quiet on certain narratives and they want you to be radically pro-Israel, you can lose everything. That's true. That, that's not true, right? You're not going to lose everything as a commentator if you're not pro-Israel. It is true that there aren't any actively you know, anti-Israel voices among the mainstream pundits in the United States. So plenty of the the mainstream pundits in the United States are are fairly neutral towards Israel. But uh, it's not like you absolutely have to tow a a pro-Israel line. Now, in certain sectors of uh, conservative media, yeah, you do. That is a fact. I'm not I'm not feeling like I need to hide from that anymore because or be afraid to say it rather is a better way to say it, because I've endured this for years. I'm just at the end of my rope. I I have given so much rope here and I am just done with it. Every person that you are a fan of, they know this. Every person that you line up to go here speak, they know this. Again, it's not even on the basis of what you say. It can sometimes be on the basis of what you don't say. That an entire mob will assemble. They'll write piece after piece after piece until you subjugate. If you don't subjugate, the bounty grows larger. Yeah, there are different groups who have different interests, and some groups are more effective at promoting their interests than other groups. And so Candace Owens gets to have fame. She gets to have prestige in certain circles. right? She gets to have money and some degree of, of influence because she tells a certain audience what it wants to hear, and she does it in an edgy way. Now, th- there's a, also a price to be paid for that. Right? People like Candace Owens, they want all the rewards of being edgy without paying a price. But there's a price. Right? You, you don't get uh, heroic status. Right? You don't get to say controversial, cutting-edge, edgy things without paying a price. So Yes, there was a large bounty on my head for the crime of refusing to suddenly hate Muslims and to condone Muslims getting bombed following October 7th. Everybody can see that. I have said... She she said so many crazy things, but she doesn't want to take any responsibility, like most pundits, right? She doesn't want to take any responsibility for her role in her own troubles, right? Any any pundit, any commentator, any live streamer who doesn't recognize it, in all likelihood, he is the, the biggest source of his own misery. Um... Is uh, is not someone worthy being taken seriously? Ah, you're probably wondering what does what does Dave Rubin say about Candace Owens? I think she's a little confused about some of the things, but I think uh, well, I hope you heard the overriding part, which is that I don't want to make it personal with her. I don't really consider us friends anymore, um, but that's just like the nature of the reality of the thing that we're all in. I think she's a right. So this is the nature, yeah, right, right wing media like left-wing media or most uh, of the leading uh, podcasts, all right, it's kind of a a social circle, and you use each other to, to try to get ahead. And and you're not supposed to speak out and, uh, you know, rock, rock the boat. Here's more from Candace. I am team God. Okay, I'm team God. I do not fear the media. I do not fear journalists. I do not fear APAC. I don't fear big pharma. What I actually fear is God. I think that one day we are all going to have to account for the things that we have done and the things that we have said. And I want to make sure that I am not a person that is parroting lies. 
the fear of losing your job, encouraging some people to spit out lies, I don't think that works in the end, right? I think you, you've got to check your priorities. Well, it sure sounded like she was she was talking about uh, fear of, of the Zionists who are going to destroy her. So that uh, that didn't exactly ring true. Anyway, uh, terrific uh, expose of Andrew Huberman, the health podcaster and Stanford University professor in New York Magazine. It's extremely weird, says Carney. Huberman texted from elsewhere saying he was busy working on a grant. A spokesperson for Huberman says he clearly communicated to Carney that he went to work. Eventually, instead of camping, the two went on a few short hikes. Even when physically present, Huberman can be hard to track. I don't have total fidelity to who Andrew is, says his friend Patrick Dossett. There's always a little unknown there. He describes Andrew as an amazing thought partner with almost total recall, such a memory that one feels the need to watch what one says. A stray comment could surface three years later. And yet, at other times, you're like, all right, I'm saying words and he's nodding or he is responding, but I can tell something I said sent him down a path that he's continuing to have internal dialogue about and I need to wait for him to come back. Andrew Huberman declined to be interviewed for this story. Okay, so I, I, we, we've chronicled on here, I've chronicled on here countless times the amount of uh, dubious information that uh, he, he releases and a terrific essay in Slate magazine that make, makes the point his podcast focuses on pseudoscience. He makes claims that appear scientific, that sound scientific, that feel scientific, but they just lack evidence, plausibility, and validity. So pseudoscience, such as Andrew Huberman's podcast, present unsubstantiated conclusions, but uh, it takes a little bit of effort to distinguish them from conclusive evidence. So he often says grains of truth, but those grains of truth are exaggerated way beyond the point of usefulness to lead you further away from truth. So he fills his podcast with confident displays of pseudoscience, topped with the appeal to authority garners by regularly repeating his academic credentials to gain your trust. So he, he's uh, great at dishing out the scientific sounding jargon that, that make you think that he knows what he's talking about. And, and you see this same sort of thing with people like uh, Jordan Peterson and all sorts of uh, would-be gurus. So this is uh, decoding the gurus looking at the descent of Jordan Peterson. He was. Now let's see where he's gotten to with vaccines. We use force for all sorts of things in terms of public health. We don't health. generally use force to invade people's bodies. How long have vaccine mandates been a thing in Canada, the United States, and the entire world? I don't think they should have been a thing. That's great I if you don't think they should have been, but when you say we don't Geneva generally policy. use force, we absolutely use force. We use, look, or we, okay, we've enforced look, vaccines for a long time. Okay. It's an important part of public yes, health. Yes, fair enough. We did it on a scale and at a rate during the COVID pandemic, so-called pandemic, that was unparalleled. And the consequence of that was that we injected billions of people with an experimental, and it wasn't a bloody vaccine. Of Just, course it No, it wasn't. Yes, it, it was. was. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's what, not. Doesn't it have a 100% percent success rate? You think it's a definition of vaccine? The whole point of the vaccine is to give your body a protein it's to train on, so the immune system works. Technology. Who cares if it's not the same? There's plenty. There's they different used types the word of... vaccine so that they didn't have to contend with the fact that it wasn't the same technology. There are different types of vaccines. There certainly that are, are. That are and different technologies. Fine. The mRNA vaccines is a type this of vaccine. This used to be technology. vaccines. Now this is vaccine. No, it was like this, and now it's like this. No, no, no. It was like this, and now it's like this. The MNR mRNA technology was a radical qualitative leap forward in technology. You can call it a vaccine if you want to, but it bears very little resemblance to any vaccine that went before that. And the reason it was called a vaccine was because vaccine was a brand name that had a track record of safety and shoehorning it in that was one of the ways to make sure that people weren't terrified of the technology. And I you think know, the reason it's called a vaccine is because they're injecting you with something that's inoculating you against something in the future because it has proteins that resemble a virus that... Hmm. Yeah, so that was uh, Destiny, the, the lefty streamer, doing an excellent job going up against Jordan Peterson. She's just become increasingly a crank on the subject of uh, vaccines, like Andrew Huberman, another anti-vaxxer. 
So he's, mm. he's on he's on board now. He's caught up. He's caught <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, he's got the memos in the meantime. <laughs> but they, I think it's a really good illustration of right when, when you do a live stream and you tap into a much larger larger audience. It's incredibly seductive. It's incredibly exciting. And if you're doing independent media, all right, you have to to be successful. Usually, deliver content that people won't get in the Los Angeles Times, NBC News, CNN. And so it just becomes increasingly tempting to descend into the world of conspiracy theories. And there's this, there's this very familiar trajectory of descent that I see from Dennis Prager to Jordan Peterson to all sorts of other people. They, they start out taking great pride in their rationality and their respect for empirical methods. And then they realize that they become much more successful and they may not even consciously realize this when they give people what a fringe audience, what it wants to hear, which is essentially various conspiracy theories about how you're being screwed over by the powers that be by institutions. And you are at times being screwed over by powers that be and institutions, just like at times you're screwing other people over. It's not like there's you know, one group of people who are just consistently good and and another group of people are consistently bad. It's not like institutions are consistently good or bad. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. Sometimes they're mixed. Sometimes I'm good. Sometimes I'm bad. Sometimes I'm mixed. We're all, we're all a mixed bag. But when you tap into the enormous audience that comes from telling people what they want to hear, that you know they're being screwed over by the powers that be and you're going to fight for them, and then you find you get more of, a, more of an audience, you know, the more edgy you go and the more conspiratorial you go, there's this very familiar trajectory of descent into start explaining more and more of the world in terms of conspiracy theories and then it turns into when you pretty much hit bottom right is is when you're explaining the world by invoking demons now i'm not talking about traditional people with a traditional view of the world a magical view of the world who see god and demons and and angels everywhere around us i'm talking about people who are incredibly successful in the public sphere uh using the, the tools of rationality and empiricism, but then they start descending when they get captured by an audience that wants to hear more and more conspiracies, and then they they descend from a world of rationality and empiricism into a world where you're explaining more and more through invoking conspiracy theories, and eventually it comes down to it it's demons that are getting people to do things. All right, when when you when you arrive at demons as your explanation. Right, as opposed to that as being a solid part of your worldview, as long as you've been thinking about the world, right? That that's a different category of people. But when you descend through conspiracies into invoking demons to ex explain the world around you, you've given up trying to understand reality. Like you've given up trying to understand how different people experience the world differently, or respond to different incentives, all right, have different experiences, and you've you've given up with explanations, rationality, and empiricism, and you're just reaching for, for the bottom of the barrel explanations. We should cut back. We can't consume as much as we, should, as we, as we are all consuming. It's like, well, maybe, except the data that I've read indicate that if you can get the GDP of people up to about $5,000 a year, then they start caring about the environment, and the environment cleans up. Oh, God, so much in there. Yeah, so this is uh, Jordan talking about there's some, there's some mechanism Right. Essentially, he's invoking demons and, and devils here. I'm responding to somebody who early on suggested this was early, early days in Jordan Peterson's rise to fame. And they wanted to suggest that, you know, in the loss of collective meaning, that perhaps climate change activism could be used to unite people. Right. This was the suggestion by an audience member. Now, they obviously didn't fully understand the extent to which Jordan Peterson is a climate change skeptic, to put it charitably, or denialist might be another way to put it, but listen to his response to this or some of it. The climate change issue is an absolutely catastrophic, nightmarish mess, and the idea that that will unite us, is, that's, that's, that's not going to unite us. I mean, um, first of all, it's very difficult to separate the science from the politics, and second, even if the claims, the more radical claims are true, we have no idea what to do about it, and so, no. And besides, it's even worse than that. Here's, the, here's one of the worst things about the whole mess is, so as you project outwards with regards to your climate change projections, which are quite unreliable to begin with, and the unreliability of the measurement magnifies as you move forward in time, obviously, because the errors accumulate. And so if you go out 50 years, the error bars around the projections are already so, so wide that we won't be able to measure the positive or negative effects of anything we do right now. So how in the world are you going to solve a problem when you can't even measure the consequence of your actions? Like, how is that even possible? 
And, and besides that, well, what's the solution? What are we going to do? Switch to wind and solar? Well, good luck with that. Just try it and see what happens. We can't store the power. Germany tried it. They produced more carbon dioxide than they did when they started because they had to turn on their coal-fired plants again. That wasn't a very good plan, but we don't want nuclear. It's like, okay, what happens at night? Huh, the sun goes down. Well, isn't that something we shouldn't have taken, that we should have taken into account? Well, we've got to flip on the coal-fired plants. Well, so it was a complete catastrophe, and all that happened was the price of electricity shot up. It was like zero utility. So that's, that's not a solution. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we should cut back. We can't consume as much as we, should, as, we, as we are all consuming. It's like, well, maybe, except the data that I've read indicate that if you can get the GDP of people up to about $5,000 a year, then they start caring about the environment, and the environment cleans up. Right, so the, there, are good, there are good points in there, but uh, it's coupled with this underlying perspective, essentially, that uh, in the final analysis, you know, Jordan is going to reach for the explanation that, that demons are... are running the show, at least running the show of those who are opposed to him. It is already happening. Um, like Jordan would have you believe that it is impossible and that it just can't be done. Um, it's not really happening. We don't know what's going on. So um, don't even try. But you know what, what strikes me, Chris, is the um, in terms of the rhetoric and the, the words he's dropping there about the WEF, about how it's basically communism, how it's... Yeah. The, the World Economic Forum. Yeah. Well, I also think that what Jordan wants to inject there is the notion that you might take specific steps right like you know a carbon tax or something like that right to to offset okay here's uh, another explanation from jordan that you care about poor people and you're willing to accept that not everything has to be focused on the standards of an elite western liberal who's tied to a tree or that kind of thing right so mm. he casts it in this extreme black and white very simple distinction the most extreme solution is the only one that you could possibly advocate and if you're not going to do that well then you're completely hypocritical and it yeah it makes the whole debate into a caricature, but that was him years ago, right? So let's see where he is now. And, and one thing to note there, Matt, is that you heard him use this thing where he likes to insert, we don't know. We've said this many times when we covered his content. One of his favorite techniques is to suggest that we don't know anything. We're really just grasping in the dark about these topics, so we shouldn't really make any statement with confidence. You heard him do it there, and he's still doing it now. Um, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that every model is perfect, They're but right perfect. now, sure, but right now we're like standing in traffic with our eyes closed saying the car hasn't hit me yet, so I don't think there's any coming. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, I think know that's I highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temperature uh, 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 detection sites were first put outside urban areas, and then as and, right, and then you have to warm. correct, then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas, and then you introduce an error parameter that's larger than the. Right. Once again, this is Jordan talking recently with Destiny. Purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data. This is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. it has right. There's something weird underneath it. It's demons. This guise of compassion. Oh, we're going to save the poor in the future. It's like that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed oh. a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor 100 years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. And we've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is, for, is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. And if this wasn't immediately impacting the poor in a devastating manner, I wouldn't care about it that much, but it is. It's hard to resist the temptation to just, but we just have to mention that he's, he's just wrong about the quality of the diet. <laughs> I, this this seems this type of thinking that that Jordan Peterson embodies like seems to be dominant in right wing populist uh, discourse. And it just does not stand up to intellectual scrutiny. Implemented in the third right, and one of the first things was the targeted destruction of communists. Right. Of right. So you also had Jordan Peterson saying recently that uh, wasn't wasn't at all clear. Whether, whether the communists were, were right wing or left wing, uh, uh, the, the the Nazis. Uh, this is a very familiar talking point on, on the right, and it is very clear. It has been studied very thoroughly. Right, the, the Nazis were right wing. That's well, a good you question. Well, because you're positing it, right? So, what, what do you think is the? Uh, let me rewind here. Jordan. North America, but but you know, in Europe and so on as well. So it is obviously conspiratorial. And in Jordan's case, it's worse because like Alex Jones, it's tied to this millennial theology about like an evil that is lurking underneath an anti-human evil, which is bending things to its will. And just to make this clear, Matt, here is one more clip from the same interview talking about that evil. Let's say that everything you've said is true. What do you think is the plan then? What is the goal? What is the drive? Like, the why push, why push obviously horrible ideas for the planet and the poor? That's a good question. That's well, a good you question. Well, because you're positive, right? So what, what do you think is the driver goal? Well, I listen to what people say. Here's the most terrible thing they say. There are too many people on the planet. Okay, so who says that? I've heard people say that for 30 years. 
perfectly ordinary, compassionate people. Well, there's too many people on the planet. And I think, well, for me, that's like hearing Satan himself take possession of their spine and, and move their mouth. It's like, okay, who are these excess people that you're so concerned about? And exactly who has to go? And when? And why? And how? And who's going to make that decision? And even if you don't, even if you're not consciously aiming at that, you are the one who uttered the words. You're the ones who muttered the phrase. What makes you think that the thing that possessed you to make you utter that words isn't aiming at exactly what you just declared? And so that's, you know, that's a terrible vision. But when you look at what happens in genocidal societies, and they emerge fairly with fair regularity, and usually with a utopian vision at hand, the consequence is the mass destruction of millions of people. So why should I assume that something horrible isn't lurking like that right now? Wow. Okay, so this is not warning about the dangerous ideas of Jordan Peterson. It's just pointing out what a, what a charlatan he's become. Jordan Peterson has done some solid work, but like with, with many people, popularity and success has destroyed him. He, he's certainly got a long way from, you know, some discussion about optimal you know, human population on planet Earth, saying that there might be some, some limits to population growth to all of that. He comes across as a millennial fire and brimstone preacher, doesn't he, Chris? I mean... Yeah, he, he, he's got that, uh, that, that what, transmuted religious fervor. ...of information. He, the Dinesh D'Souza has written a book about Hitler, you know, being left-wing. Right, this is, yeah, Jordan claiming that... Uh, it's not clear whether Hitler's left wing or right wing. In the title, right? National Socialism. Um, no, I... Right, because it's got socialism in it, therefore it must be left wing. And the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. Well, but the so I mean... Okay, let me get the beginning of this. Data and, and the data from the uh, geosciences. So, I mean, that just goes to show, if he seems like, he, like a careful scientist, he's getting, you know, very concerned about the quality of the data. That's not, that's not what's going on here at all. Yeah, that leads to uh, the last tips that I want to play on, like, because he, he has a study that he wants to carry out, which hasn't been run yet, and which he thinks can solve a pressing issue of our time. So, so what's the issue? Well, let me first let him introduce it. Does yes, it well, I also think it's an open question still to what degree Hitler's policies were right-wing versus left-wing, and no one's done the analysis properly yet to determine that. Well, what because there's a national socialist movement for a reason, and the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. Well, but the, so, I mean, there was no, uh, you know, cooperatively formed businesses that were owned by all of the people for the people and distributed to the people, and I don't think redistribution was high on Hitler's list of That's things true. to do. So mm. yeah, that old chestnut. Uh, was <laughs> Hitler <laughs> and the Nazis right wing? Yeah, this, I, I join his confidence with which he says no one's done the analysis. Really, historians haven't looked into the ideology behind the Nazis and they haven't overwhelmingly determined that it was a far right uh, nationalist <laughs> if, ideology. If, you know, some even non-professional historians might be able to figure that out. <laughs> like it's not yeah. that hard. I mean, the thing which is tripped up Jordan here, which is very common amongst conservatives seemingly, is that they use socialists in the title, right? National socialism. Um, now, historians have known that, Matt, and they've addressed that. And it is true that the Nazis in the earlier periods tried to appeal to some of the dissatisfaction that was being scooped up right, by the communists right, yeah, right, yeah. At, yeah. at the time. But it was absolutely opportunistic. And you can see that because you just need to look at what Nazi actual yeah, policies were when they were Hitler... actually implemented in the Third Reich. And one of the first things was the targeted destruction of communists, yeah. right, of, of socialists. So it's, it's mind-boggling to claim that. But this is a common viewpoint amongst the right more recently, right? Mm. And, and this, again, I speaks to Jordan's you know, network of information. He, the Dinesh D'Souza has written a book about Hitler, you know, being left wing and, and so on. So all these polemical right wing. Right. And uh, Jenna Goldberg, right. Uh, liberal fascism, right. Liberalism, fascism, completely different ideologies. Figures. They, they want to categorize Hitler as left wing mm. because they, they don't want him to be in on, the like, yeah, on their... right, which is so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's... <laughs> it, is, it is so stupid because there is, you know, admittedly, Maybe I can just restrict it to Australia. Your typical person who votes for the Liberal Party or your typical person who votes for the Labour Party is not trying to usher in either a great leap forward and a five-year plan or the final solution and, and annexing New Zealand, right? <laughs> it's just yeah. different. Anyway. Yeah, I, so, yeah and, Australia, so, you're I'm fine. Just trying, I'm just trying to agree with you that it's just stupid. You don't need to sort of disown these historical things because they happen to be no. you know, on, on your side of the, the fence, right? And try to find a way that you can make them out to be, oh, well, really, they were, they were on the other side. Look, we're moderate left-wing people. All right, that's from the podcast, Accounting the Curious. This is uh, Dennis Prager. It was far right or was actually a far left ideologue. Okay, thank you for your time. I enjoy listening to Fireside Chat every week. All the best. Thank you. Hitler uh, was, uh, was left-wing in that he believed uh, in socialism. Remember, Nazism is national socialism. Very few people know that, especially if you go to college where you don't learn much. But that is okay. Just because Nazism had national so socialism in, in its name doesn't make it left wing, right? Every historian, pretty much who's studied this, notes the the obvious that Nazism 
is a right-wing party that believes in hierarchy. It is what Nazism stands for, National Socialism. In that sense, it was left-wing, but it was not left-wing in another sense. The left divided the world by class. That's the classic Marxist division of the world, class, the proletariat, and the, uh, and the oppressor, if you will. Whereas Hitler divided the world by race. Race is not a left-wing or a right-wing value. Well, it, it tends to be much more of a, a traditional right-wing value, right? Uh, hyper-nationalism, right? Hyper-allegiance to your racial in-group, right? That tends to be much more on the right. Than on the left, right? There are tens of millions of Americans who do not much like black people, and these people overwhelmingly vote Republican. So, you know, why, why do these, you know, fringe, fringe, you know, right wing commentators just seem to descend lower and lower and lower? Like, what the heck is going on here? Doing more of that kind of thing—that's what you want to do. You, you find a way to align your beliefs to those. There's, there's another kind of dissonance resolving. Right. You find a way to reconcile your beliefs with, with your audience, right? You find a way to reconcile your beliefs with that which will give you the, you know, the biggest audience, the, the most income, the most love, right? We all naturally tend to incline towards love and applause and attention like plants growing towards the sun. Or they're trying to appeal to their audience, but they're, but they're consciously lying as opposed to them just being frankly delusional and being just as crazy as they sound. Um, and they are in good faith, if you like, <laughs> about their crazy opinions. And, you know, the, the truth is, and the interesting thing is that I think that, that it's both um, is happening at the same time. We've talked about this, that the way the cognitive dissonance works, the way that people tend to align their beliefs with their actions, and they generally take actions that are in their best interests. You know, in this case, will yeah. be leading to more clicks, more attention, more, more positive feedback. You do, you're doing more of that kind of thing. That's what you want to do. You, you find a way to align your beliefs to those. There's, there's another kind of dissonance resolving, which is resolving the dissonance of your opinion or belief about a specific topic and make it, make it consonant with your broader worldview. So, so let's say Jordan Peterson is a, a conservative, is, a, is very inherent, suspicious of the kinds of things like climate change. He, he might have you know, come across some, some evidence, some opinions about climate change being a genuine thing. It, he likes to think of himself as a scientist. He might have felt, felt it convincing, but he would be strongly compelled to find some problems with that and find a way to allow himself to uh, disregard that information such that he can form an opinion about climate change that is fully aligned with his broader worldview. And you know, I, I don't think the gurus are special in that regard. Everybody, all of us are prone to doing that backwards kind of reasoning where you start off with your conclusions, you start off with your deeply held beliefs, and then you work backwards and find out a way that you can deal with. Right. We are not primarily driven by reason. Reason is a tool that we implement to take us where we instinctually want to go, right? The most powerful forces that, that drive us are our genes, our imprinting, and the messages and incentives that we get from our in-group, from our tribe, right? It, it's not the independent power of reason that uh, tends to lead us in life. The, the various bits of evidence broadly construed in such a way that allows you to come to the conclusions um, that you've already decided upon. And we'd like to believe that we, we start from the, whatever evidence, whatever information is available and work forward to beliefs and then revise those beliefs or, or even and more general sort of worldviews based on that. But um, sadly, we are mere mortals and we're not very good at that. Yeah, and this point stands regardless of the current replication rules about some issues with the cognitive dissonance literature. Just I can hear the psychologists in yeah. my head raising this. This this is not the same as uh, various claims made about cognitive dissonance not mm. holding up because yeah. the basic idea that yeah. people seek to resolve inconsistencies in a way that's psychologically satisfying is obviously true. Now, that isn't also to say though, Matt, that everyone does things. These are all psychological mechanisms which uh, afflict everyone, you know, motivated reasoning and all these kind of things, but not to the same extent as like a Jordan Peterson. No. He is unusual. The conspiratorial ideation, the belief in a malevolent power animating essentially every position that he doesn't like, that is not normal. He is an outlier in that perspective. So it is right to have empathy and to acknowledge that we're all fallible, but we're not all alleging the kind of things that Jordan does publicly, reliably. And I think these clips, this episode should illustrate that uh, while he was always not great. And you heard like his early climate change take, which is not that different from his current one. But overall, he's become much more extreme. He's much more closer to Alex. Right, because he receives more and more money and more and more love from his audience for pouring out this, this nonsense. Uh, Tucker Carlson's got a blurb for Steve Saylor's new book, Noticing an Essential Reader by Steve Saylor. And Tucker Carlson says, if 
the meritocracy was real, Steve Saylor would be one of the most famous writers in the world. Someday historians will revere him. In the meantime, read this book. So g- good on uh, Tucker Carlson for speaking up for Dennis Prager. All right, back to a little bit more from Decoding the Gurus. Jones now than he was than when he initially appeared. And it might be to a certain extent in delivery, but I think it is also in the degree to which the conspiratorial worldview mm. has uh, encompassed everything. Yeah, that yeah and, and, I think, and I think, as you said, Chris, it's, it's not just a conspiratorial worldview. It's also that like demon-infested, millennial, yeah. religious worldview. For, for Jordan, these things go together. Like those things go together for a lot of flat earthers, actually, now I think of it. Or QAnon. Yeah, or QAnon, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it's pretty probably pretty common. Um, but what's your thought? I mean, so there's clearly been a dissent. It, it hasn't been good. And, you know, Jordan is not alone amongst our gurus to have traced such a journey. Yeah. What would you attribute it to? Would he have become like this if he had not become a celebrity? It just, just gotten a bit older. And, and... I primarily attribute it to incentives, right? We We tend to want to follow the easiest path and the path that gives us the most uh, love and, and money and uh, attention. And a bit more, you know, weird as we all do. Or like, is it his, his psychology, his personality, or is it something to do with the, the social and uh, financial dynamics? I think that there is multiple contributing factors. One is that he <laughs> appears to be a grandiose narcissist and that he always saw himself as uh, a kind of revolutionary thinker with big ideas, right? His maps of meaning book is claiming to absolutely revolutionize our understanding of. Right. If you see yourself as a revolutionary thinker, if you see yourself as a, a big deal, then it's going to be much easier to sustain that kind of belief about yourself if you are peddling fringe theories that uh, are completely ignored by mainstream academia and news media. So the bigger your narcissistic need for believing that you're unique and special, uh, the more likely you are to fall for and to spread conspiracy theories and to make conspiracy theories uh, the basis of how you know you understand how the world really works. At least you see through all the BS. So many topics, right, and to be of great significance to the world. And that's before he had much of a public profile. He sought out a public profile. He wanted to be a commentator. You know, he would appear on Canadian television in a, a tweed outfit or whatever, like, you know, in the bowler hat. Or I, I don't know how to describe his look, but he clearly wanted to be uh, a figure of commentary, a figure of note, and saw that as his role. And his old mentor mentioned about how he spoke about, you know, wanting to establish a religion to buy an old church and, and kind of give sermons, right? So that's not normal. None of that's normal behavior. His railing against the IRB review ethics board from having the right to examine his work, the, the standard thing which all academics go through when they're trying to do research with people regarding that as being, you know, beyond the peel that they would dare or have the right to assess him. All that speaks to a kind of narcissistic, self-absorbed personality. And then I think when you add to that his clear obsessions and constant wrestling with his religious devotions or lack of religious belief or with his desire to be religious, that creates, you know, a kind of a heady stew and one which is also illustrated by the amount of illnesses that he has picked up. You know, he's got so many autoimmune, yep. so yep. many uh, strange, uh, psychological strange and physical I- ailments. Yeah, he, the last few years, he always seems on the verge of tears. All right, back to New York. Magazine, Andrew Huberman's Mechanisms of Control, the Private and Public Seductions of the World's Biggest Pop Neuroscientist. Article here by Kerry Howley. Physiological sigh. Two short breaths in and a long one out to reduce stress. He pulled countless people from their laptops and put them in rhythm with the sun. Thank you for all you do to better humanity, read comments on YouTube. You may have just saved my life, man. If Andrew were science teacher for everyone in the world, someone wrote, no one would have missed even a single class. Asked by Time last year for his definition of fun, Huberman said, I learn and I like to exercise. Among his most famous episodes is one in which he declares moderate drinking decidedly unhealthy. As Mackenzie puts it, I don't think anybody or anything, including Prohibition, has ever made more people think about alcohol than Andrew Huberman. While he claims repeatedly that he doesn't want to demonize alcohol, he fails to mask his obvious disapproval of any... Okay, just uh, a guy who just reached incredible levels of podcasting success by, by telling an audience what it wanted to hear and dressing up his message in science sounding jargon. 
don't appear to add up to anything research has shown to be meaningful in terms of human health outcomes. And indeed, the problem with most of the probiotics is they're typically not concentrated enough to actually colonize. One learns from Dr. Lane Norton in a no- So Huberman has sponsors who are just selling snake oil, right? That's how he makes millions of dollars promoting supplements that are at best useless. November 2022 episode of Huberman Lab. AG1 argues that probiotics are effective and that the 75... And remember, there's nothing going on in Huberman Lab. He's always invoking Huberman Lab, but nothing's happened there for many months. Five ingredients are included not only for their individual benefit, but for the synergy between them. How ingredients interact in complex ways and how combinations can lead to additive effects. That's the good news about podcasts, Huberman said when Wendy Zuckerman of Science Versus pointed out that her podcast would never make recommendations based on such tenuous research. People can choose which podcast they want to listen to. Whenever Sarah had suspicions about Andrew's interactions with another woman... Okay, so he was carrying on affairs with six women at once, but lying about it and uh, getting in deep with, with various women, encouraging them on, on a journey that they were going to make babies together, that uh, they were going to build their lives together. So it's one thing you're out there and you're having a lot of promiscuous sex. It's a completely different thing when you're hoodwinking people in, in a, a false story and as well as uh, this story makes it sound like a human has been passing on some pretty nasty sexually transmitted diseases. You can't have long-term affairs with six different partners. Yeah, unless he's um, juggling multiple uh, phone accounts or something. Right, like that. right, so, right. And some men try to do that, but um, I think it's a, it would, could be very taxing. Yeah, that's what uh, human does. Right, uh, juggles multiple phones. So account. sometimes people are selecting for somebody who's really nice, really funny. We get along so well. I mean, there are other criteria, right? I'm just trying to get you to say it's okay for us to be shallow, really, at the end of I the mean, day. I mean, it's it's as okay Basically. to be shallow as being shallow is as important to you, right? There are people who um, are like, they have their list, right? They're like, I want to be with someone who graduate college or I don't care or I want to be with somebody who you know is physically attracted to etc cetera, etc cetera. I mean the reality is that no matter how attract two people are to one another like at some point it becomes familiar mm -hmm. but there are certain people like I would put I'll just disclosure I'm actually become in a re relationship monogamous relationship I actually become more attracted to the person I'm with and I think it's something through the nose it's like a pheromone thing yeah I become That's very conditioned to them Right. It's not that no one else becomes attracted to me, but I become very conditioned to them. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know that everyone's like that. I've only been me, but I know that there are some people that get really restless after they've been with the same person for a little mm. while. And sometimes that's psychological, like they never got it out of their system. They married the first person they were with. And other times it could be physiological. You know, Both of them. so, so Both there's of them. a lot of range on these. I mean, the biology constrains it. To answer your question, it constrains yeah. it, it sets some outer bounds on this. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think, for instance, that we can become attracted to, like, tree frogs, for instance, just because we decide that they're the only option Have you left. been to India? <laughs> <laughs> All right, New York Magazine piece on Andrew Huberman, worth reading for many reasons, worth repeating. There's no, no benefit to these supplements. They're just lucrative. All right, so even if those peddling supplements have an MD or a PhD, it remains snake oil. Of ours uh, said to me, you know, listen, when it comes to romantic relationships, if it's not a hundred percent in you, it ain't happening. And I've never seen a violation of that statement where it's like, it, yeah, it's mostly good. And they're this, and is it like the negotiations? What, well, already you're, 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 it's doomed. And that doesn't mean someone has to be perfect. The relationship has to be perfect, but it's got to feel hundred percent inside. Yeah. Like, yes, yes. And yeah, as a mutual friend of ours. So all, all the podcast bros are sticking by Andrew Huberman. So people like Lex Friedman and Joe Rogan, uh, Glenn Greenwald. But the, these articles in New York Magazine and in Slate are absolutely devastating. For a run or I will do a resistance training session and I will listen to music, usually an album all the way through or a playlist all the way through. And that's because I don't want to be going onto my phone very often. In fact, these days, 
I use an older separate phone that doesn't have any text messaging or communication to the outside world, but it has music loaded into it or onto it uh, that allows me to just listen to music so that I, I don't run the risk of getting distracted texting and doing things like that. I just want to focus on my uh, physical exercise. I should say that phone also has audio books, podcasts, things I've downloaded to it. So it's a place where I can listen to things, but not communicate with the outside world, at least while exercising. There are times when... Right, uh, just pure lies. I mean, the guy's juggling multiple phones for his you know, multiple sexual partners and constantly texting them. Call. They planned to go Christmas shopping the next day. Sarah showed up at his house and found him on the couch with another woman. She could see them through the window. If you're going to be a cheater, she advises me later, do not live in a glass house. On January 11th, a woman we'll call Alex began liking all of Sarah's Instagram posts, seven of them in a minute. Sarah messaged her, I think you're friends with my ex, Andrew Huberman. Are you one of the women he cheated on me with? Alex is an intense, direct, highly educated woman who lives in New York. She was sleeping with Andrew. And she had no idea there had been a girlfriend. Fuck, she said. I think we should talk. Over the following weeks, Sarah and Alex never stopped texting. She helped me hold my boundary against him, says Sarah. Keep him blocked. She said, you need to let go of the idea of him. Instead of texting Andrew, Sarah texted Alex. Sometimes they just talked about their days and not about Andrew at all. Sarah still thought beautiful Eve, on the other hand, might be crazy, but they talked some more and brought her into the group chat. Soon, there were others. There was Mary, a dreamy, charismatic Texan he had been seeing for years. Her friends called Andrew breadcrumbs, given his tendency to disappear. There was a fifth woman in L.A., funny and fast-talking. Alex had been apprehensive. She felt foolish for believing Andrew's lies and worried that the other women would seem foolish, therefore compounding her shame. Foolish women were not, however, what she found. Each of the five was assertive and successful and educated and sharp-witted. There had been a type, and they were diverse expressions of that type. I can't believe how crazy I thought you were, Mary told Sarah. No one struck anyone else as a stalker. No one had made up a story about a dead baby or torn out hair with chunks in it. I haven't slept with anyone but him for six years, Sarah told the group. If it makes you feel any better, Alex joked. According to the CDC, they had all slept with one another. The women compared time-stamped screenshots of texts and assembled therein an extraordinary record of deception. There was a day in Texas when, after Sarah left his hotel, Andrew slept with Mary and texted Eve. They found days in which he would text nearly identical pictures of himself to two of them at the same time. They realized that the day before he had moved in with Sarah in Berkeley, he had slept with Mary, and he had also been with her in December 2023, the weekend before Sarah caught him on the couch with a sixth woman. They realized that on March 21, 2021, a day of admittedly impressive logistical jujitsu, while Sarah was in Berkeley, Andrew had flown Mary from Texas to L.A. to stay with him in Topanga. While Mary was there, visiting from thousands of miles away, he left her with Costello. He drove to a coffee shop where he met Eve. They had a serious talk about their relationship. They thought they were in a good place. He wanted to make it work. Phone died, he texted Mary, who was waiting back at the place in Topanga. And later, to Eve... Okay, so the the degree to which you keep your phone charged pretty much uh, correlates with your credit score aka your reliability right are you are you a solid person or not and so whenever i hear an explanation that someone's phone died so a ding 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 right this is this a person who's using lousy excuses and uh, very likely irresponsible just not someone that you can count on not a good sign when people invoke, you know, phone die. Thank you for being so next, next level gorgeous and sexy. 
Sleep well, beautiful, he texted Sarah. The scheduling alone, Alex tells me. I can barely schedule three Zooms in a day. In the aggregate, Andrew's therapeutic language took on a sinister edge. It was communicating a commitment that was not real, a profound interest in the internality of women that was then used to manipulate them. Does Huberman have vices? asks an anonymous Reddit poster. I remember him saying, reads the first comment, that he loves croissants. While Huberman has been criticized for having too few women guests on his podcast, he is solicitous and deferential toward those he interviews. In a January 2023 episode, Dr. Sarah Gottfried argues that patriarchal messaging and white supremacy contribute to the deterioration of women's health, and Andrew responds with a story about how his beloved trans mentor, Ben Barris, had experienced intense suppression or oppression at MIT before transitioning. Psychology is influencing biology, he says with concern, and you're saying these power dynamics are impacting it. In private, he could sometimes seem less concerned about patriarchy. Multiple women recall him saying he preferred the kind of relationship in which the woman was monogamous, but the man was not. He told me, says Mary, that what he wanted was a woman who was submissive, who he could slap in the ass in public, and who would be crawling on the floor for him when he got home. A spokesperson for Huberman denies this. The women continued to compare notes. He had his little ways of checking in. Good morning, beautiful. There was a particular way he would respond to a sexy picture. Mmm, hi there. A spokesperson for Huberman insisted that he had not been monogamous with Sarah until late 2021, but a recorded conversation he had with Alex suggested that in May of that year he had led Sarah to believe otherwise. Well, she was under the impression that we were exclusive at the time, he said. Women are not dumb like that, dude, Alex responded. She was under that impression? Then you were giving her that impression. Andrew agreed. That's what I meant. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put it on her. The kind of women to whom Andrew Huberman was attracted, the kind of women who were attracted to him, these were women who paid attention to what went into their bodies, women who made avoiding toxicity a central focus of their lives. They researched non-hormone-disrupting products, avoided sugar, ate organic. They were disgusted by the knowledge that they had had sex with someone who had an untold number of partners. All of them wondered how many others there were. When Sarah found Andrew with the other woman, there had been a black pickup truck in the driveway, and she had taken a picture. The women traced the plates, but they hit a dead end and never found her. Tell us about the dark triad, he had said to Bus in November on the trip in which he slept with Mary. The dark triad consists of three personality characteristics, said Bus. So, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. Such people feign cooperation, but then cheat on subsequent moves. They view other people as pawns to be manipulated for their own instrumental gains. Those who are high on dark triad traits, he said, tend to be good at the art of seduction. The vast majority of them were men. Andrew told one of the women that he wasn't a sex addict. He was a love addict. Addiction, Huberman says, is a progressing narrowing of things that bring you joy. In August 2021, the same month Sarah first learned of Andrew's cheating, he released an episode with Anna Lemke, chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. Lemke, the author of a book called Dopamine Nation, gave a clear explanation of the dopaminergic roots of addiction. What happens right after I do something that is really pleasurable, she says, and releases a lot of dopamine is, again, my brain is going to immediately compensate by down-regulating my own dopamine receptors, and that's that come-down, or the hangover, or that after-effect, that moment of wanting to do it more. Someone who waits for the feeling to pass, she explained, will re-regulate, go back to baseline, 
If I keep indulging again and again and again, she said, ultimately I have so much on the pain side that I've essentially reset my brain to what we call anhedonic, or lacking in joy, type of state, which is a dopamine deficit state. This is a state in which nothing is enjoyable. Everything sort of pales in comparison to this one drug that I want to keep doing. Just for the record, Andrew said, smiling, Dr. Lembke has diagnosed me outside the clinic, in a playful way, of being work-addicted. You're probably right. Lembke laughed. You just happen to be addicted, she said gently, to something that is really socially rewarded. What he failed to understand, he said, was people who ruined their lives with their disease. I like to think I have the compassion, he said, but I don't have that empathy for taking a really good situation and what, from the outside, looks to be throwing it in the trash. At least three ex-girlfriends remain friendly with Huberman. He goes deep very quickly, says Keegan Amit, who dated Andrew from 2010 to 2017, and Okay, terrific uh, New York Magazine story here on Andrew Huberman. And here's uh, another burst from Decoding the Gurus. Of course, people like, want the network and stuff. No, Sam isn't like that. Sam doesn't need to network with us at all. So, but I... All right, talking about Sam Harris and talking here about the business of podcasting and how it comes at the cost of intellectual integrity. Uh, in general, there's like a weird dynamic where people you know, like kind of wanting to get on bigger audience podcasts and all that. It, it very much is a, an incestuous network and, uh, you know, business for a lot of people. Um, so we, we have the luxury of not that not being the case for us because of our, um, you know, alternative lives, but you do feel it and you do get contact and emails that just like, yeah. 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 yeah this is something I want to talk about in the podcast, Chris, actually, I want to make a little segment where we just mentioned that we can actually bring in some of that information you got from, uh, Chris Williamson's mate or whatever that you heard because it's all oh, yeah, yeah. from our personal experience. But in a nutshell, guys, I mean, before we started doing this podcast, I didn't understand how this, that it's an industry, right? And, you know, we, we were just, we just did it. We had no understanding and it, it gradually became clear. Like, for example, one of the things that helped me understand is like this, some other person who has this podcast and invited me on said very polite things. Oh, I really like what you guys are doing. It'd be great to have you on. So I went, okay, all right. I'll talk, I'll, and I, I gave the usual spiel about, about gurus and that. But then it became clear afterwards that he was kind of expecting a reciprocal invitation to our podcast because what it really is is a kind of a cross-promotional thing. And and he it's not so much that he was super keen to talk to me. It was more that this is this is a business arrangement, right? Where where podcasts do this cross-promotion thing. And then subsequently, um, you know, we've had invitations. Oh, you know, will you will you endorse us, uh, endorse our podcast? And in exchange, you get this, that, and the other. Um, we get contacted all the time by like book authors and things like that. Not surprisingly, by their agents who are who are, they're wanting to you know, talk about their book and something. And I just want to make it clear to everyone that our answer to all of that shit is always no. And even, I mean, it, the only the only time I said yes before is I didn't understand what it was that was going on. Now now I'm clear about how this business works, um, where, where people don't really, it's like, all, all I want to do is create more content, get more views, make more money. That's, that's what, that's what, that's what the business is. And, and like, we've got um, Kevin Mitchell coming on and I just want to make it really clear to people that we didn't have him on because he has contacted a by his agent and, and, you know, it's like a, some sort of business thing. We have him on because we read his book and we liked it. We think he's interesting and we'd like to have him on. That's it. <laughs> it's the same with, same with Paul Bloom and Robert Reich. Like we have yep. both of them on, even though they are, you know, like podcast extras or whatever. But it wasn't because we want to, you know, like uh, promote Paul's book or whatever. I think we did it really at the wrong time if that was because <laughs> it was yeah. months after. But it, uh, like we had both of those on because we were interested to talk to them. Right. And we, the, it's the, so I'm not saying it like, there's never opportunities where like, you know, you kind of end up that somebody suggested or whatever. And then you're like, okay, you know, the, and, and maybe the actual topic ends up not being the way that you thought it was going to be or whatever the case might be. But I'm, I am saying that with Matt and me, the consideration, uh, like just to give an example, I'll, I, I don't know the person's name, so I can't even mention it, but we were contacted by somebody that has a book, which is kind of relevant to the stuff we cover, but, and the, and the person suggesting them as a guest had, appears to understand the podcast and, you know, could pitch why it was relevant and all these kind of things. But both Matt and I were, and the book is making a bunch of claims that would take us a whole bunch of time to fact check. It's kind of alleging potential like conspiracies and that kind of thing. And it's written by an investigative journalist, but it would, it would require us to like either accept their framing 
um, or to go and do a bunch of research so we could critically evaluate the claims that they want to make. And it's just like, you know, no, because <laughs> it's not, we don't have the time to do it. Uh, and mm, we wouldn't do it without critically looking at the claims. Like uh, it wouldn't, but it would yeah. give us content, right? Like if, if our yeah. thing was yeah. content, then we should yeah. just bring them on, interview them and like stick yeah. it out. But yeah. Yeah, then move on to the next one, the next one and produce as, get as many through as possible, produce as much content as possible. Yeah, like it's like, you know, like Chris said, if, if we quit our day jobs and became professional podcasters, then we'd be strong just because just we're normal humans. Like, Right. You, you want you want your podcast and your live stream show and your deeds and your performance at work and your performance at church and, and your performance uh, in, in synagogue and going down the street. You want your good deeds to be marching ahead of you as opposed to just cranking out content without regard to its quality. Like everyone else would be strongly susceptible to all the same incentives, um, which is that it's a grind, right? They're, they're grinding away, trying to build an audience. Everyone wants to get to that point where they're like bloody John Campbell, who's making what millions of dollars a year by $3 million a year by doing anti-vax stuff. Like that's where it can lead you. Um, when no, you're that's focused not gonna on happen. metrics. <laughs> I mean, if that well, happens. <laughs> I mean, that's not gonna happen. Yeah, so, so John Campbell is the guy with the PhD in nursing, who's just become increasingly anti-vax. No, but you know what I mean? You, you're, gonna comp- you're gonna get compromised. I mean, Chris, I, I, told, I told, yeah, Salary of the CEO of Bet365. And like speaking of gambling, like let me give an example. I've told you, Chris, so you'll be a bit bored. Sorry. But, I'll just check out. Yeah, yeah, just check out. <laughs> but like, in, on, and I'm not like, I have a policy, like in terms of research work, that's my, that's my day job doing, doing research. Gets- so if you have standards, right? If you have policies, if you have commitments greater than yourself, you're going to appear stodgy. You're going to appear pompous, right? You're not going to be cool and hip and uh, as slippery as those who don't have any greater commitments than themselves. Funded by someone, um, in my case, pretty much always government organizations. But the thing is in gambling, because there are inherent, it's very political, there are inherent issues with conflicts of interest. Um, I, I recently have just won a proposal to the New Zealand Ministry of Health, big project. I've uh, proposed to subcontract uh, a, a researcher down there. She also did a little project looking into health and wellness or something of, but she was getting paid by the racing, it was, it was paid by the racing group so I, I had to i had to let her go not use her for that thing because of the conflict of interest um some some researchers in the uk they're, they're basically replicating some of my work over here they, they they're putting in a proposal to an organization called gamble aware and it's a very fine organization like it's a, it's a funding body um it's got an independent scientific review board it, it funds good work i've got no problem with it but it is funded by discretionary contributions regular contributions from the gambling industry right this part of part of their social you know do-gooder type thing but the point is is that they're discretionary so that means that if, if that gamble aware funds research that they don't like or whatever, they might considerably pull their funding and exert influence over research that way. So I've had to say, no, I can't have my name on that project. You can't, can't even pay me a dollar. I'm still going to help them out just because I'd like to see the research done. I mean, and I'm not special, like that's my policy. I just inherited it from Matt Rockloff, my colleague, because, you know, um, like, but that's. Yeah. So they're, they're frequently in academia, you know, far higher moral standards than those employed by independent podcasters such as myself. I just point that out. Like that's, that's the way academics treat <laughs> conflicts of interest, like pretty seriously now, but in the, but in podcast um, they, they got none of that. There is just no conception of conflict of interest. Huberman's taking money from this and endorsing that Campbell's doing this. Like nobody talks about where their money's coming from and what their incentives are in terms of, you know, how they're getting paid. And it's like, it's super important to put, to put your cards on the table and say, this is where, this is where you direct, especially when you're an opinion maker, like being a researcher is the same as being a podcaster, right? Cause you're a knowledge worker, you're creating, like you're giving opinion in a way. Right. And so being biased is important and you just need to, everyone needs to earn a crust. Everyone needs to live. Um, everyone gets funded by something, whether it's Patreon donations or gamble aware or the New Zealand ministry of health and through yeah, through your job, you know, um, but. You know, no, no, you, I meant all your job. You're funded by you know whatever company employs you. So well, yeah, that's right. Yeah, like I'm, I'm technically paid by my university, but you know what I mean. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, Tucker Carlson is singing a different tune about Israel. The U.S. Days. aid, military aid to Israel, and the implied security guarantees, some explicit but many implied security guarantees of the United States to Israel, probably haven't helped Israel that much long term. It's a rich country with a highly capable population. Like every other country, it's probably best if it makes its decisions based on what it can do by itself. And I don't see any advantage to the United States. I mean, I don't, I I think it's important for each country to make its own decisions.
again, I don't think you can overstate the lack of wisdom, weakness, short-term thinking of American foreign policy leadership. These are the architects of the Iraq War, of the, just the totally pointless destruction of Libya, totally pointless destruction of Syria, and the 20-year occupation of Afghanistan that resulted in a return to the status quo. So like their, of the Vietnam War, their track record of the Korean War, even going back 80 years is uninterrupted failures. I just don't have any confidence in those leaders to, imp when was the last time they improved another country? All right, so some good points there from Tucker Carlson. I think the Korean War was probably worth fighting, but we only had to fight it because the U.S. gave explicit signals that they didn't care about what was going on in Korea. Just like the first Iraq war was because the U.S. gave off signals that it didn't care if Iraq swallowed Kuwait. So uh, millions of, of pro-Israel Americans are very concerned about the Biden administration turning against Israel and I, I've been talking to friends about that th this week, and I think my, my friends are completely wrong. There's, there's no reason to be concerned that uh, the Biden administration is going to turn against Israel. Now we see an article here in the Washington Post, U.S. signs off on more bombs, warplanes for Israel. So Biden wants to win re-election. He wants to win Michigan. He, he doesn't want to lose Arab and Muslim voters in, in key battleground states. But uh, Biden is not going to turn his back on Israel. So Washington Post says, despite a widening rift with the Israeli government, the Biden administration continues to authorize the transfer of 2,000 pound bombs and other weapons. All right. They are authorizing the transfer of billions of dollars in bombs and fighter jets to Israel. All right. Despite their, their rhetoric about great concern about Israel's you know, military offensive in southern Gaza. So new AIDS package includes 1,800 2,000-pound bombs, 500-pound uh, bombs, uh, you know, all sorts of arms continuing to flow from the United States to, to Israel. So I don't think that uh, Biden is going to be uh, turning his back on, on Israel, that uh, Israel is going to be you know, fighting against the United States uh, anytime soon. A little bit more on the business of podcasting, in particular, the the new bloke on the block, uh, Chris Williamson, who's become much bigger over the past, what, three years? Williamson, you know, working with the, the macronutrients and the micronutrients, you know, in the at the research center, like dropping things into test tubes and psh, like, oh, man, if we add 6% more potassium to this, <laughs> not, <laughs> it'll uh, really, really crack things. But, oh, somebody mentioned about um, Chris Williamson. I, I want to just clarify something there because you know, Matt hasn't had, I think, any contact with Chris Williamson since we right. Hey, him. let's say hello um, to uh, our I, friend, I do. Elliot like, Blatt. What's is... going on, bro? Uh, blessings, dude. Can you hear me? Blessings. I can. Loud and clear. All right. So, long time no chat. A little pre-shop. It's a uh, stream, you know? You got, you got yeah, pre-Easter, bro. Oh, Easter, too. <laughs> That's right, man. So spring is sprung, man. So listen, um, it's a lot of things been going on here, but uh, the most recent is, um, so I, I went for like six weeks without drinking coffee. Wow. Uh, have you ever tried this? No. We'll go on to Well, favorite. I usually don't drink coffee. So right. it oh, is more like. you have that you like to eat, but consume, but that's another. My thing. Adderall. So how's that going, by the way? Uh, pretty good, but I can't handle 20 milligrams. Like, even though I had 20 milligrams at like 5 a.m. yesterday, I still yeah. couldn't fall asleep until like 1 a.m. this morning. So I, I can't, I can't handle 20. 10, I can handle just fine. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I sort of had the opposite problem. Like, I, I thought I could live without coffee for a while. And for some reason, for the first two or three weeks, it didn't affect me. And then for the past couple of weeks, I was just completely comatose from from more, you know, from morning till till dusk. I couldn't function effectively anymore, and I was really starting to wonder if I was, you know, had something deeply wrong with me. And so today, and I finally you do. broke. You do. Well, I, I do. <laughs> yeah, right. it's undebatable. But uh, so I finally just, I felt like I couldn't um, work anymore. You know, I was going to lose my job or something if I didn't like do something. 
So, <clears throat> so I just relented. You know, I had this sort of, you know, Ubermensch fantasy about being, uh, you know, not dependent on any coffee, you know, just I, I didn't need any of these external inputs. And so I finally broke down, though, and I just drove and bought some coffee, made myself a cup. And, and what happened? And it was just like hitting the, it was just like turbocharging my life. I've been just crushing Fantastic, isn't it? all of this stuff that I've been like putting off and I can see the world in color again. I can execute. I, I'm just back to who I was. So that's what know, ADHD you, medication does, but without so, the, yeah, the I was wondering, is, you know, is that literally, uh, you know, did you have this sort yeah. of, before and after I mean, it, it's different. There's not the jangly effect. Uh, but if if you get the dose right, um, there are all sorts of things that you just don't feel up to doing, and then you take your ADHD medication. And you, number one, you can sustain your focus. All right, so it's not like it it comes and goes, but you can sustain. You can you start acting like a normal person, and you're not as emotionally volatile, and you can just methodically, you know, take care of the things that are most important. So. Why didn't you just uh, try the coffee route and to go just direct directly to the pharmaceuticals? Like, do you think? Just- well, it, there are different effects. I, I've tried. Like, I, I had my first cup of coffee at age twenty-seven, and yeah. over the last fifteen years, I, I probably had, uh, on average, uh, say three three cups of coffee a week. Yeah. Uh, so th- there are some benefits to caffeine, but if you if you want to overcome ADHD. Uh, ADHD medication is just far more effective than caffeine or nicotine. How about nicotine? Have you been off the nicotine the last eight weeks? Oh, I haven't touched it for a while. I treat that like uh, I treat, you know, an, a pharmaceutical. It has a really strong effect on me. And the last time I did it, I took the whole piece and I got what I needed to be done, but it, it took me like three days to return to something re- re- approximating normal. So Ooh, uh, that's not good. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't, that's going to be like in case of emergency only. Uh, so, yeah, you, 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 you want to fine tune your, your medications. Like you don't want th- that jangly effect for days. You don't want to lose sleep. Uh, on the other hand, you don't want to take an inadequate amount of medication. Yeah. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> um, so anyway, I've been trying to. Oh, uh, I may have lost you. No, I'm here, bro. Uh, uh, okay, you, you could never okay. lose me if you if you see two just two feet in the sand, and you think that I left you. No, that's when I was carrying you. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I had some interesting. So you remember, like uh, you know, beginning of the year, I was really down the dumps, and I was sort of alluding to some. Uh, um, you know, yes, bad events in my life, and I didn't really ready to talk about them and so forth. So I, I'm ready to talk now, bro. Are you ready to? Oh, listen? bro, this is a safe space. <laughs> All right. So about a year ago, I talked about this. I told you about this this kid that I sort of hired to work with me. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> over time, you know, it became clear that he was ripping me off. And so I, I need to sever the relationship. And so I finally severed the relationship about last summer, around June at June. And um, but I just kind of wanted to let it peter out. I didn't want it to be like, um, I didn't want to like do like a Trump, you're fired situation. I just kind of wanted to yeah. let it grow and just peter away, hopefully. So long story short, um, he kept sending me these quote unquote bills for work he's done. Right. And I knew he didn't do it. So I, I said, you're going to have to, you know, send me some accounting and show me what you've done here because I just can't be paying you this money without understanding what you've done. Because right now I'm not seeing it. Right. Mm-hmm. So long story short, um, he never sent me that. And then I caught him. So I had two storage spaces. One's in town, one is up in Napa, right? I drove up to Napa and I caught him like just wholesale stealing all the books from the storage space that I was storing there, right? 
And worse than that, he was with his mother. <laughs> he was doing this with oh. his mother. Right. I, 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 you know, I catch it. So we have this huge confrontation. Uh, you know, I say, what are you doing? Et cetera, et cetera. You know, this is, you're stealing, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. And that basically severed the relationship, you know, in a very sort of climactic way. Right. Just, just in a very decisive, unambiguous way. So six months go, uh, go by. I didn't really think much about it. And I get this knock on the door. This, it's a weird sort of knock on the door in the middle of the day. And it's a process server. Oh, and, great. And he sues me. The guy's suing me. And I go, are you kidding me? The fucking chutzpah on you. And so this is just unbelievable. And like, I'm saying, I don't even take it seriously because it's so preposterous, right? That... I sort of put it on like the second page of my priorities to like prepare mm -hmm. for the lawsuit, you know, immense mistake, <laughs> immense yes. mistake. Right. And so, so anyway, so the, the hearing comes, you know, the beginning of the year of the year and I lose, he sued me for $7,000 and I lost the case. <laughs> and I was like, and small claims and small, small claims. claims. Yeah. Oof. I, I and you like, showed up and you showed up and made your case to the judge. I showed up and made my case, yes. Okay. But uh he managed to blow a lot of smoke in the eyes of the judge, right? And uh and I hadn't sort of I didn't realize the extent so it's not like a, it's not like I had everything he was presenting, right? Mm -hmm. I you know, I just he had like a brief description in in the filing, so I said, "Okay, I'll Make a similarly brief, uh, you know, rebuttal. I won't put a lot of effort into documenting my side of the story and so forth. Long story short, he he wins, right? And I am completely crushed by this, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, like incapacitated, like uh, I can't think about anything else. I don't know. You've been through some legal stuff, have you not? Yes. And did you find that an enjoyable process? No, it's. Would you say it's like one of your least favorite? Yes. Things to undergo, and so all right. So you know, this is you know, this is the first time it's ever happened to me, and so I didn't realize. And this is a relatively trivial matter, you know. It's not like jail was in the offing or anything. It was just it was a lot of money, it was seven grand, but it wasn't like you know, incarceration was something that could happen. So I didn't take it, Carol, you know, it didn't take it that seriously. And so anyway, so I lose, we get to that point. And then, so I've got a month to appeal, right? You have a month to appeal after the judgment. So, but as it turns out, so January has 31 days, right? And the way I did the math, and it was so like, you know, I had like the ostrich effect where you just... You put your head in the sand. You want to. You don't want to deal something very unpleasant. So it's sort of like you just leave everything to the absolute last minute. And so I ended up leaving everything to the absolute last minute, and I missed the deadline by a day because you know I had to like I had to respond by the eighth of uh, or what was it the eighteenth of February? Um, yeah. It it was thirty days. But I just figured, okay, I'll just, so whatever the number was, let's say it was the 8th, so I said February 8th. But in truth, it was February 7th because January has 31 days. So I missed the deadline by a day. And so, you know, this was devastating, right? And yes. I then I say, come on. I tell the, the, the is there anything that you can do, right? I, I'm, ta I'm talking to the clerk and they say, well, you can file appeal anyway, and the judge might grant it. They might not, right? And I said, oh, what the hell? I'll do it. I'll just throw a Hail Mary, right? And amazingly, they granted me the appeal, right? Wow. Yeah, wow. which is like a Hail Mary, and it's like jump ball in the end zone, and it comes down, and I get it. You know, I catch it. It's touchdown, right? And so, <clears throat> and so I get a new date, like 30 days from that, which was like last Wednesday. And I go, and this time I'm prepared, right? And um, 
So I get there and he doesn't even show. So I just win. Hmm. And like this immense relief comes over me. Um, so I finally, you know, this, this uh, cross that I've been walking around with for three months has finally been lifted from my back. And uh, I just feel great. I didn't realize like what a weight that had been. And I just, all the lessons I've learned through this, this painful process about my, my tendency towards uh, procrastination and yeah. not confronting difficult things. And it just really yeah, brought sounds that to like, the fore. Wow. Sounds like ADHD. Oh, bro. Oh, that's a low bro. bro. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it just sounds like a cup of coffee, bro. That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> But in the course of this, so when you go through one of these like sort of deep, uh, traumatizing, unsettling experiences, it causes you to sort of, or caused me anyway, to completely um, just, uh, what's the word, es excavate all of this long, yes. long suppressed, buried, unpleasant things that I need to take care of. I just did them all in this three month period, like one by one, chunked through it, just gritted it out, you know, hated every minute of it. Like, you know, caulked the bathroom tub, fixed the kitchen sink, you know, organized my papers, did all this kind of stuff, you know, just, it, I just felt like I was going through some sort of cosmic penance that I had to do. And then by doing this, I just felt like God rewarded me with this sort of layup. <laughs> Of, of I don't know. Yeah, what, 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 what's that that movie, The Karate Kid, where he starts learning how to fight karate and he starts off just cleaning the guy's car and yes. the, the, the philosophy is you polish here, you shine over there. Yes. Everything and is So everything you started polishing, you started polishing your bathroom and it started shining in, you know, other parts of your life. That's a good way to look at it. I didn't actually see the movie, but I'm aware of that scene in the Karate Kid with the polishing. But wax it, it on, just, wax off. Right. I've heard that many times. Yeah. But it, it's sort of another thing. It's just life is practice. You you need a good practice, right? A, just a just an airtight set of disciplines that you follow, and you don't deviate from. That that helps, but it, it that that's great. It may be more important to see if you can realize realign the chaotic impulses so you are going through life with all sorts of maladaptive chaotic impulses just coursing through your your brain into your physiology into your body you know impulses that will lead you to destruction so if there was a way to turn off most of those self-destructive impulses that would be a lot easier than trying to go through life with an iron level of discipline uh self-destructive impulses um maladaptive simply impulses that are not in your best interests so normal people right they build towards that which is most important mm -hmm. yeah. but if you if your physiology is constantly being bombarded and driven in directions that are against your best interests you can try to exercise that iron discipline and number one i don't think it'll work consistently and number two, it's just so much easier if you can turn off the noise and then build something great on top of that quiet mind. Right. But how does one just turn off the noise, my dear? Well, if you have ADHD, you take your medication. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Let's talk but, about the post ADHD life of Luke. The one that one, what is one that is characterized by its uh, absence of streaming. <laughs> so do you think there's a correlation between your uh, ADHD use and ADHD? Yeah. Your, yeah. Because I was, absence? I was probably, yeah, I was probably streaming more than was aligned with my best interests. Now I'm better in touch with my best interests and you know, other opportunities for how I spend my time have very profitably opened themselves up to me over the past few months. And so I am acting much more aligned with my best interests rather than uh, spending so much time streaming. Well, that's good. Um... But like that happens when the mind quiets down. So 
I often use streaming to calm my anxiety. Like if I'm failing in real life, sometimes I'll try to use streaming to to put a blanket over you know that that messy bed of failure or humiliation. Um, like I I need to feel special, you know. I need to feel like I'm good at something. I need to feel competent. And if I feel incompetent in the real world, right, there are times that that's so painful and frustrating, it gives me the energy to live stream. Then other times that lack of competence, you know, destroys the energy for, for live streaming. But either way, I'm being bombarded with all sorts of impulses that are not necessarily aligned with my best interests. If I can start to quiet that bombardment and then just build a, a normal life, you know, recognizing normal incentives. Uh, most people, they their incentives should not be towards producing a lot of live streaming. Yeah, um, it does seem like one streamer after another is, is is gets taken down by some scandal that's orthogonal to their life somehow. Um, so, like a stream addiction is sort of in a cluster of other addictions, you know. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they, they sort of appear together, like Ralph being, you know, the textbook example of this. Um, but others, too, like that need to stream, it, it's probably not a strong indication of, uh, uh, of you know, emotional health. Yeah, so it's I, too bad. There's, a, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there's an exception. If, um, one, you, you make, you know, an adaptive amount of money. Like, so if the rewards are doing the streaming, you know, exceed the price paid for devoting that time. So for, for a small number of people, that's true. And then second, uh, there can be intrinsic internal rewards for streaming, which I've often experienced just the intellectual and social challenge. So you don't have to get financial rewards. There are other intrinsic rewards that uh, make streaming an adaptive practice for, for some people. But overwhelmingly, it does seem to be well, I don't know if it's overwhelming, but there does seem to be a tremendous amount of self-destruction with streaming. Yeah, and like anybody that does it uh, to make a living, you know, they, they decide that's going to be their income. There's ju it's just fraught with so much peril because um, then you truly are uh, subject to audience capture and all kinds of other, uh, you know, uh, subtle uh, dangers that, accompany that and i don't know it should come with streaming should come with a warning label i think you know it, um, well th that's good that you've you know i mean it's bad for us uh, as an audience you know who it's sort of you know th these types of streams this this became sort of a um you know predictable element of life for me anyway, you know, cause it, it would sort of accompany me making dinner or something. It was sort of like, I knew I was winding down when Luke was streaming, mm. you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It was this sort of a ritual. And then you sort of become uh, accustomed to always thinking that ritual will be there. And then, then somebody kicks the stool out. Somebody starts taking Adderall and kicks the stool out from underneath my ritual. You know, there was an adaptation period that I had to go through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like if, if you go to a club, you know, every day and then you, you leave it. I mean, you, you formed probably a lot of relationships and, and, you know, you've come to make, make that, that club or that workout or that, that group or that uh, Torah study group or that church, a foundational part of your life. But you were, you were, you were putting a blanket over a mess. Right, you you're distracting yourself with the club, the religion, uh, the the endeavor, the hobby, uh, to distract yourself from what you should have primarily been taking care of. Yeah, what do you think about? Are you a tidy person? Are you? Do you keep your? You I'm keep... average to. I, I'm average, maybe maybe slightly above above average for straight men. So you have like one section that's a bit chaotic and you just kind of throw all the chaos there and then you throw a blanket over it but generally speaking the rest of your place is tidy uh 
I, I'm not sure I can judge for myself. And, and I'm not going to turn the camera uh, <laughs> on, on that. So um, it, I'll, I'll just leave it as an open question. Uh, no, I you think don't know I'm averaged. Yet. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about it out loud. I think I'm average to above average. And one of the most devastating things I ever heard from a friend, he came to visit me in my apartment and he said that you, my, my place looked like that of a suicide victim. <laughs> So it's certainly been a, a major problem in my life. So certainly w women would come over for the first time and then they'd say, okay, let's get out of here. I feel really icky being here. Yeah. Um, do you think, so there's this school of thought that says, you know, great minds like a nice mess, you know, geniuses don't have tidy surroundings. And I think that's bullshit. Yeah, I think generally speaking, being tidy is is better than not. I, I think it's even more important to be clean. So you know, I, I shower good. regularly. I, I clean regularly. You know, I vacuum. I dust. I you know, look for the cobwebs. I, I you know, I keep I keep things clean. So that's that's a very important value to me. Yeah, uh, that's good. Um, and then it, it just know. it's just how much it serves you. So. So, um, I mean, I, I keep everything I do, you know, backed up often to multiple places. So, you know, I think I practice pretty good hygiene with my electronics. <laughs> Spoken like a true streamer. Hey, has there been any word on JF? No, uh, I don't know why that story doesn't get more attention. No, exactly. And just like this eerie quiet. Uh, I used to be skeptical about his guilt, but now I, I'm almost convinced. Um, which talk about, you know, talk about uh, if, you know, talk, just as I was saying, somebody streams for a living, you know, it's probably indicative of real emotional <laughs> problems. If this turns out to be true, what we all suspect, you know, that's just ironclad evidence that streaming, you know, is, is a warning flag, is a red flag in and of itself. A lot anyway. of a lot of women won't date a podcaster. Really? Because yeah, they they think if a guy has a podcast, they they recognize that it's it's a big warning sign. Now I, I know I know at least one professional podcaster who's you know married with kids. So, I mean, plenty of people do it, but yeah, it, it's probably a reasonable warning sign. Okay. N not and always like, applicable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I guess, like, Ben Shapiro's all over the news now. He's not looking good right now. What's he in the news for, for parting ways with Candace Owen? Yeah, and then a lot of his quotes are sort of coming back to haunt him, and they're being waved around to show, you know, it's like he has one quote like my loyalty to the United States is strongly conditioned about its relationship to Israel, you know, and it just doesn't look good. It's not good for the Jews, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Hey, Juven may surpass him as being the, the better advocate for, for the tribe. I don't know. <laughs> so now, now I, 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 I haven't, I haven't heard yeah. much about JF. Like, is he, is he sort of dropped off the map? I don't know. There's just like this eerie. To me, it's an eerie silence. Yeah, and yeah. It's 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 changed. Yeah. So, which sort of tells me that you know, I think something's going to more break. and more people think that there's something nefarious. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if over the summer. There's a, there's a, you know, there's an arrest. Because I think the Canadian police just know it. They just can't pin it. You know, they just don't have the evidence. But they, you know, you know that co cops get a sense. Mm -hmm. I think that's going on there. Anyway. Uh, so anyway, look, things are looking up. Just thought I'd call in. I don't know. Compare notes. I'm so glad that that worked out, bro. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks, man. I feel it feels good. It's been a weight off. 
And, uh, you know, hail coffee, hail our people. Okay. Blessings. Take care, bro. All right. All right blessings. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> if you know me, you, you should know that I like, you know, to argue and, um, a whole bunch of things, but I, I, I find, uh, people with particular personalities and perspectives, like very interesting. And Chris Williamson is, uh, a very interesting personality yeah. and perspective. One that he, I actually don't have much uh, experience of. Like he's, he is, he's not like Rogan. This is one thing. He's not like Rogan. He is somebody that is just kind of focused on growing his channel, being the best optimizer, you know, person that he can be. And he, he does have an ethics. It's just, it's just such a different <laughs> one that you might, that you might imagine. But like he interviewed uh, Andrew Tia, for example, and he didn't release the episode. Um, now I can't think of that many, like uh, Lex Friedman or whatever, that would do this same. But maybe they, maybe they would. But like, yeah, and he didn't interview Brett and Heller on during the pandemic. You know, given the kind of guests he has, that is, that's kind of a choice. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm a good angel. I, yeah, and I think yeah, sorry, and maybe you don't want to say this but you you have been somewhat influential because he does he does actually he see he seems to lack some sort of moral center of his own but to his credit he seems to treat you as a slightly prosthetic right so decoding the guru is not the world's you know most downloaded podcast but it's incredibly influential so a a much smaller audience can be much more influential and substantial and you know make more of a difference and a difference for the good than a larger show conscience and actually asks you whether he should I'm do something like one, that and, and you say no 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 you know, yeah, i'm not the only one i this is the thing i feel like chris is optimizing that he has you know many different people that opinion he asks and then he he realizes the position of this person from all these different angles and then calculates like what he's gonna do so you know um but but to his credit uh he does listen to like critical opinions and stuff and he's not so sensitive that's one of the surprising you know, things because they like almost everyone else in that space, they don't really like. I give him feedback on the interview he did with Eric Weinstein before. It was, I was pretty harsh, like very directly harsh about it. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, and he, he responded as if it was harsh because it was, but then like uh, he didn't, you know, like say, well, that's a, I can't ever take I, it. It's very different from like Constantine. As soon as we said anything negative to Constantine, he was immediately in like the DMs kind of saying, you've revealed your true colors. Like I came on your show and it was like, that doesn't, you know, we didn't say we're never going to say anything critical of you. Like in fact, <laughs> yeah, Con Constantine has very thin skin though, but you know, yeah. And, and Chris yeah. is extremely handsome. This is true. Like <laughs> <laughs> He's got the most symmetrical face that I've ever seen. Um, yeah. You have to give yeah. him credit for that. Yeah. So, but he, he's, he's interesting in that, you know, if you want advice, like if you were interested in gaming podcast metrics and stuff, it, like <laughs> he's a he's a machine for that kind of thing. So yeah. I, I like just the the different perspective that it gives you access to. And he is also somebody who's active in the whole Rogan world. Like he lives in Austin now, right? Mm -hmm. And he he hangs around with those guys and uh, goes to the parties and stuff. So uh, yeah, and that's, he, I'm just saying yeah, he, he doesn't mind telling you a little bit of the inside goss. He doesn't it doesn't break any confidence. It's just no. it's just. Uh, but it, it is interesting. Yeah. Mm. So that's, that's it. Yeah. And, um, Chris is 36, which Chris, me, I'm not 36. Okay. A few thoughts here on, uh, Hassan Piker, the useless left wing live streamer His partner. Who's this, the British fitness guy that just did the thing about, you know, how all podcasts are a, a money making, um, scheme basically. Um, and it's just like this 20 minute video of them. Uh, like kind of joking around at some gym or whatever. It's very, you know, youtube -y content. But the thing is, his friend is kicking the piss out of him hard. He's just constantly, you know, referencing that he's on the juice and that he's... Talking about Chris Williamson. Uh, and and in a very, you know, like a, a kind of... And then they're, they're kind of having banter in a British way because they're both British. And like, th that's one of the things is to be comfortable with kicking the piss, right? And uh, that is something that I think... Um, like you would need to be able to do. And and he displayed uh, the ability to take a piss and have a piss taken out of him, which is the, the necessary criteria. Um, and uh, Adam was asking about people who are on the agenda to cover. First is Sean Carroll. He's up next. Um, we have the Kevin Mitchell interview um, that we, we want to do. Um, and then we have, there's a whole list of people that we're supposed to um, clear off. But 
Mm -hmm. not, just as he asked that, is not going out of my head. I know Matthew McConaughey and his weird multi-level marketing thing is there. Um, and but who, who were the other ones? There was, a, there was a whole, oh, Hassan Piker. Or sorry, Hassan, Hassan Abi. Like, Hassan, Yuval Harari. Yep, is, yep. Is, is yep. You want to do uh, him. And um, is it Hassan Piker? Or is it Hassan? I think his name online is. The, the thing he did with the hooky pirate. We're going to do that because it's such a joke. It's such an indictment of YouTuber and streamer culture, that, that interview. It's, it's insane. We might do a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a short season around like YouTubers and streamer types. Um, Wait, why is it an indictment of live streamer culture when you've got some terrible live streamers any more than you can use the telephone or a fax machine for stupid purposes? And we wanted to do, who's the Naomi Klein? We wanted to do her, remember, in the category of, um, like yeah. anti gurus or people that are, um, yeah, in interesting, but I, I have some issues. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, my mind always goes blank. I'm only just thinking of the guests we got coming, Kevin Mitchell, and who, who's the lady we're going to Okay, a little bit more from Do our, um, our Garometer for Sam after after this live stream. Right? That's right, Sam That's Harris. Right. Yes, we're going to do Sam. And I mentioned to you, I've not listened to him, Matt. That's how productive I am on my commute. I, swear, I am beginning to feel like, though, that listening to things at, like, times two and a bit speed, it gives you, it, it, like, it's just makes everyone sound like they're, you know, they're just rushing through points and this kind of thing. But, um, it, yeah, I, I listened to Sam and Jordan Peterson episode, and it, it goes, I, I was wondering how our decoding is going to hold up, right? Because we kind of talk about why does he want to talk to Jordan Peterson? Why is he saying, you know, to Chris Williamson, well, you know, I don't see, I would, yeah, I'm happy to speak to Jordan. And you were saying, but why? <laughs> like, well, mm -hmm. Why do you want to? Talk to him, and I was uh, mentioning. I think I said this in response to some of the subreddit, the Sam Harris subreddit. If these two were really invested in their worldviews, they should have lots to discuss. Because Jordan thinks that the WEF is like instilling global communism, going to make everybody eat bugs. That climate change is a complete fraud. That you know, the, so that COVID vaccines are are deadly. And are killing people. Yeah. Right. So they have a big divergence there. Sam, on the other hand, is worried about people uh, being polemical and reactionary, addicted mm. to Twitter, and promoting yeah. misinformation. So he should, he, he, should, he should consider Jordan Peterson as one of the big figures that is pushing that extremely dangerous worldview that he hates, right? Yes, he should. <laughs> he should. Uh, barely a word about any of that. They do talk about Twitter a little bit. Sam complains about Elon Musk, and then Jordan says, well, let's get on to something else. They both agree Twitter can be deranging, but maybe it's also good. It's unclear. Then, yeah, Twitter can be deranging by Jordan Peterson. He has been tweeted in deranged poems <laughs> for the last few months. Or, or uh, cum milking porn, right? Like in dystopian China, whatever the case is. And then they, uh, they do mention vaccines. Sam mentions that, you know, people can't even agree on whether vaccines are good or bad. That's a shame. That's a shame. Can't, we can't come together on that I agree. Next point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and then the majority of the episode is spent on the Bible and truth and Jesus and this kind of thing. And there again, you might think, Good chance they've got quite divergent views, right? Like the and and so there might be some hmm. arcs and friction and whatnot. But essentially, it's just exchanging monologues. Like Sam yeah. gives a monologue which completely contradicts Jordan Peterson's view, talking about you know religious texts as dogmatic and the thing that if you're a Christian, you have to believe that Jesus is divine, which is you know not a it's not a truth. It's and that, without that, you are, you you aren't Christian. Jordan completely ignores that. Talks about you know mystical poetry and stuff. Then Sam talks about. Buddhism and how it's not about evil, it's about ignorance is the problem, not evil. Then Jordan talks about how everybody believes evil is the problem. And that's it. They're just kind of trading mm. back and forth, you know, and at the end. Yeah. yeah, saying that they, you know, it was a great conversation and they're, they're glad they could talk, look forward to talking again. Oh, and Sam's going to produce 20 minutes of behind the paywall content for the Daily Wire. Um, yeah. See, that's that's the problem with this. Like, we've got to stop calling it the IDW sphere. It's, it's whatever it is, right? This yeah. influencer, they're influencers of some kind. And this is the problem with them. Like, if we had a conversation, like, superficially, you and I, you said this to me, Chris, superficially, or on, on, the, on the face of it, you and I have a similar worldview to Sam, Sam Harris, right? Politics yeah. might be slightly different or whatever, but essentially, you know, the same kind of worldview. Yet, if Sam spoke to us, we would be fighting the whole time yeah. because we because we wouldn't just, like, exchange platitudes and monologues. And if we spoke to Jordan Peterson, it would not go well. No, he wouldn't like it. He wouldn't like it. And, and also, of course, Sam hasn't doesn't mention anything that Jordan has done. Doesn't you know? There's there's no obvious that he did any research into anything that Jordan has done. Jordan doesn't reference really anything that Sam has talked about in the past. So well, just... this, is, this is my theory, Chris, that they are like you're often dismayed at how little these people know, right? In the sense that they don't seem to have looked into anything from oh, each is other. that horrible. Yeah, each other or anything. And, oh, Alex Jones. Like yeah, Alex Jones or that Tate, Andrew Tate. Like you name it, they don't know about it. Um. And they certainly, at some point in that um, episode we covered, Sam Harris sort of wonders whether or not Jordan Peterson listens to his podcast. Of course he doesn't. Jordan yeah. Peterson would not listen to anyone else. Like, they, they're just in their own little worlds, and they don't, they don't actually pay attention to anything that no. they should, right? 
Speaking about being in my own, own little world, it used to be that when I walked, say, down the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica or in a crowded part of Beverly Hills, I'd always see someone I knew because I, I moved to Los Angeles in 1994 when I was 27, and I was incredibly social between 1994 and 2007. So I, I became acquainted with thousands of people in my, my first uh, years in, in Los Angeles. And now I walk through crowded sections of Beverly Hills, crowded sections of Santa Monica or downtown LA. I almost never see anyone I know. I, it's, I, I notice this with a lot of my friends too, that uh, as we've gotten older, our, our lives, our worlds have just become smaller and smaller and smaller. I was so social between 94 and 2007 I was going out, if not every night, then then three nights a week uh, on average, and just going to, to parties, to gatherings, to uh, press club events, to readings, to classes, and kind of sad here. I, I'm about to turn 58, and it just seems like my life has just become so much smaller. So what have you noticed for you? Now... I think with a normal person, all right, their, their world becomes smaller in that it becomes devoted to family and to children. And so you spend less time socializing, right? You spend less time partying, right? You spend less time with acquaintances and with friends, and you spend more deep time with family. And so that's probably the, the, the norm, the healthy way to go, the most adaptive. But if you don't get married and you don't have a family, you're not going to spend in all likelihood, as you move into your late 40s and 50s, you're not going to spend nearly as much time you know, out there going to, to parties and, and social gatherings. And so you find your world just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So one reason I do live streams is to kind of one, one attempt to, to fight against the, 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 the Luke Ford world that's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and, and try to you know, recapture a taste where – if I walked among a thousand people in LA, I, I would see someone I knew. Right? Yeah. No, like if I was going like, to go talk to someone before I talk to them, uh, I'll at least spend an hour or two to check what they do. Right? Like usually when people yeah. ask me to do something, yeah. I do that yeah. before yeah. I do it. <laughs> and it doesn't take long. Like it doesn't take long to get the to get the long and the short of Jordan Peterson. Right? Like a quick browse through his Twitter feed, a quick look at YouTube or whatever. You'd go, okay, I, I know, I know what's going on with this guy. But either Sam doesn't, or he's got a, does a really good impression of playing totally ignorant. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, it it feels like because in this episode of Jordan Peterson, I'm I'm just going to say this because I look like, well, it's behind you know it's the paywall who's gonna who's gonna uh, so how many people are slumped over on the ground in Santa Monica and Beverly Hills? Very few, right? Both Santa Monica and Beverly Hills do an excellent job, generally speaking, at combating homeless. Uh, Beverly Hills does a much better job than Santa Monica. Like Beverly Hills has ambassadors walking all around, so relatively few people in Beverly Hills, uh, probably five times as many in Santa Monica, and then five times as many slumped over homeless people in Los Angeles proper. But uh, Santa Monica has done many, many good things to try to reduce the homeless population. Uh, feed this back to Sam, but like they're talking about, you know, what Sam's been doing and Sam is saying that his life now, since he's been off Twitter, is, is basically pure pleasure. Right, like he just is doing things every day that he finds rewarding. He's having conversations that are nice, and he's, you know, he's kind of pursuing his interests. And you know, Matt, I know I I have a unique pathology in a way, but I've got young kids, multiple jobs, uh, various hobbies, right, <laughs> for better or worse. And yeah, I'll do research on stuff like this. So like, if Sam is a multi-millionaire with this, you know, huge empire that means that he only needs to put out a podcast once every couple of weeks or whatever, couldn't he? Couldn't he just spend an evening looking what Jordan's been up to? And yeah, like like you are like these guys. It's not just Sam, but most of them are professional pundits, commentators. Right? Yeah, commentators, right? That's that is literally their one job. Um, but they don't seem to do any preparation or any or anything. You know, they, no. they just they just turn up and and you know. If they want, so the one thing they do is like if they invite someone who's a you know thinker or whatever, they'll probably read their book or they'll try to do it, which is a good thing. If they have a guest, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, if they have a guest, so that's that's the thing. But it's it's kind of like that's that's what they want to do, like. Have you guys noticed that different people seem to have different gifts? So when I walk down busy streets, I notice that when a man and a woman are about to collide, 95% of the time, the woman gives way 
because women are much more physically fragile and physically vulnerable than than men, right? Playing the same sport, say soccer, right? Women are far more likely to receive serious injuries compared to men. And then you see if a, a young African American gentleman and pretty much any other group are about to hit the same place, right? Ninety five percent of the time, the the non African like gives way because he doesn't want to get into a confrontation with with others. It's kind of interesting, like what happens when you walk down the street with with power and vigor, and you're maintaining your frame, but you also don't want to be a joke. So uh, sometimes uh, on familiar streets, I will you know often give way. Then I notice that I was always giving way to this particular couple, and then after like eight times of always giving way to them uh, on the street so they could have the sidewalk and I'd step off onto, onto the grass. Right? One time I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving away. And they were kind of surprised and they had to step off into the grass. But I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't have done that because it was a mixed race couple. And, and maybe that, maybe that came across as, as racist. But it, it's, I, I enjoy seeing who gives way because we all, pretty much try to get as much out of life as we can, as long as we can morally justify it to ourselves. Order Google to hand over the names, addresses, telephone numbers, and user activity of those who watch certain YouTube videos. The feds were trying to track down a criminal and were apparently tracking you in the process. The senior national correspondent Kevin Cork is live in D.C. with the big news about Big Brother. Kevin, good evening. Evening, Trace. According to Forbes, the government asking Google to give up names, addresses, phone numbers, and user activity of all account users who access certain YouTube videos back in January of 2023, as you mentioned, as part of a... Right. So I'd expect if you used a VPN, you could get, get you know, avoid, avoid this. Uh, I, I don't think this is inherently horrible. I mean... It depends on how much good comes from doing this. Are you able to use this to effectively catch really bad guys? Larger criminal investigation. Now, in another instance, police also asked Google to provide a list of accounts that viewed and or interacted with YouTube live streams. That could lead to information, again, on what they claim was a police search. Privacy experts tell Fox Business tonight this discovery is absolutely terrifying, saying it allows the police to target people for simply consuming content. Quote, it's unconstitutional. It's terrifying. And it's happening. Yeah, there's, there's a terrifying component. But uh, of course, this sort of thing is, is going to happen. Right. Everything we do, you never know when it's going to be made public. That's why taking a strategy that everybody knows everything is just a much healthier way to live. Not that I, I fully live up to that. Yeah, there, ideally there, there's a realm of uh, privacy, but people have to be proactive and use, use VPNs if they want to avoid this sort of thing. Every day, these YouTube warrants are just as chilling, allowing police to target people simply for the content they consume. No one should fear and knock at the door from police. They're not going to get a knock on the door because of what the YouTube algorithm serves up, right? The police would need to see a lot more evidence. This would just be one piece of evidence among probably 10 things that they'd need to target bad guys. Police, simply because of what YouTube's algorithm serves up. Now, the discovery also comes as Meta is said to be changing its algorithm to restrict Instagram users' access to political information. And, of course, as an upcoming Supreme Court... Right, here's a lecture by Chris Cavanaugh, one of the Decoding the Gurus guys. Left-wing populist movements as well. Um, on the modern internet ecosystem, which facilitates the spread of all sorts of ideas, but particularly conspiracies. But the point to emphasize is, read any history book, you'll find conspiracies all over the place. So it's, you're not going to, they're not something that has just recently developed. And in a hundred years, there will probably, when we're all on, there will be new conspiracy theories for people to worry about. So... If we are hoping to uh, get rid of them, it's an unfortunate, very unlikely thing to happen. Um, okay, so that's the context. Now, in terms of gurus, the typical word for, or the typical understanding of the word guru relates to spiritual master or uh, expert in some tradition. It's from Sanskrit and can refer to teachers or mentors, usually with a particular tradition or, or field, um, and often associated with some kind of 
esoteric knowledge. You have it in mainstream traditions and you have it in fringe movements. And most of the religious movements that emerge throughout history tend to have charismatic leaders who could fit into a template of a guru as traditionally understood in the spiritual sense. So you have some examples there, Alan Watts, Sag Guru, um, and the Buddha. Uh, so it, in those cases, it's, it doesn't have to be something which is negative, right? There is also the, the kind of common vocabulary use of a stats guru or a presentation guru or whatever, like somebody who's very good at something. So not always negative. And, and that, that traditional understanding of guru will come back. But the other category which is relevant is shamans, um, and there you have all different kinds of shamans across um, different cultures. Uh, the kind of dramatic performances are, tend to be a, a, a relative consistent, but the, the kind of famous representation of, of shamans in media is illustrated in, in these images. Um, and Manvir Singh has discussed um, shamans as, um, from the point of view of cultural evolution, an early developing uh, profession which is useful and necessary for human societies in the respect that humans all over the world, especially in pre-modern societies and whatnot, have to deal with uncertainty from the environment, from other actors, malevolent forces that, that might be out there. Um, and in dealing with, trying to deal with those, uh, it's not unreasonable and a lot of our cognitive systems move towards there being the potential of agency involved. Uh, now, if there are unseen agents acting on natural uh, phenomenon or social things or making people sick, then mm, a, an intuition that emerges is, well, how can we, what can we do to prevent them doing that or to try and channel uh, something more productive in the way that they are behaving? Um, and if somebody emerges who says they can communicate with the unseen spirits or forces that are controlling the natural environment, controlling fate and destiny, um, that, that would be helpful if you could pay someone. Right, and uh, it's one of the one of the attractions of, of gurus is that they can provide a sense of of security and ease and peace. That uh, you you finally found the truth. They will uh, give a, a framework for creating you know meaning and purpose and right and wrong out of a confusing, messy reality. All right here's the conclusion of the New York Magazine piece on Andrew Huber. Continues to admire him. He has incredible emotional capacity. A high school girlfriend says both she and he were troubled during their time together, that he was complicated and jealous, but a good person whom she parted with on good terms. He really wants to get involved emotionally, but then can't quite follow through, says someone he dated on and off between 2006 and 2010. But yeah, I don't think it's... She hesitates... I think he has such a good heart. Andrew grew up in Palo Alto, just before the dawn of the Internet, a lost city. He gives some version of his origin story on the Rich Roll podcast. He repeats it for Tim Ferriss and Peter Atia. He tells Time Magazine and Stanford Magazine, Take the list of all the things a parent shouldn't do in a divorce, he recently told Christian bowhunter Cameron Haynes, they did them all. You had, says Wendy Zuckerman in her bright Aussie accent, a wayward childhood. I think it's very easy for people listening to folks with a bio like yours, says Tim Ferriss, to sort of assume a certain trajectory, right? To assume that it has always come easy. His father and mother agree that after our divorce was an incredibly hard time for Andrew, though they do not agree with some of his characterization of his past. Few parents want to be accused of pure neglect. Huberman would not provide the name of the detention center in which he says he was held for a month in high school. In a version of the story Huberman tells on Peter Atia's podcast, he says, We lost a couple of kids. A couple of kids killed themselves while we were there. New York was unable to find an account of this event. Andrew attended Gunn, a high-performing, high-pressure high school. Classmates describe him as always with a skateboard. They remember him as pleasant, sweet, and not particularly academic. He would, says one former classmate, drop in on the halfpipe where he was encouraging to other skaters. I mean, he was a cool individual kid, says another classmate. 
There was one year he, like, bleached his hair, and everyone was like, oh, that guy's cool. It was a wealthy place, the kind of setting where the word au pair comes up frequently, and Andrew did not stand out to his classmates as out of control or unpredictable. They do not recall him getting into street fights, as Andrew claims he did. He was, says Andrew's father, a little bit troubled, yes, but it was not something super serious. What does seem certain is that in his adolescence, Andrew became a regular consumer of talk therapy. In therapy, one learns to tell stories about one's experience. A story one could tell is, I overcame immense odds to be where I am. Another is, the son of a Stanford professor, born at Stanford Hospital, grows up to be a Stanford professor. I have never, says Amit, met a man more interested in personal growth. Andrew's relationship to therapy remains intriguing. We were at dinner once, says Eve, and he told me something personal, and I suggested he talk to his therapist. He laughed it off like that wasn't ever going to happen, so I asked him if he lied to his therapist. He told me he did all the time. A spokesperson for Huberman denies this. People high on psychopathy are good at deception, says Buss. I don't know if they're good at self-deception. With repeated listening to the podcast, one discerns a man undergoing, in public, an effort to understand himself. There are hours of talking about addiction, trauma, dopamine, and fear. Narcissism comes up consistently. One can see attempts to understand, and also places where those attempts swerve into self-indulgence. On a recent episode with the Stanford-trained psychiatrist Paul Conti, Andrew and Conti were describing the psychological phenomenon of aggressive drive. Andrew had an example to share. He once canceled an appointment with a Stanford colleague. There was no response. Eventually, he received a reply that said, in Andrew's telling, well, it's clear that you don't want to pursue this collaboration. Andrew was, he said to Conti, shocked. I remember feeling like that was pretty aggressive, Andrew told Conti. It stands out to me as a pretty salient example of aggression. So to me, said Huberman, that seems like an example of somebody who has a, well, strong, aggressive drive, and when disappointed, you know, lashes back or is passive. There's some way in which the person doesn't feel good enough no matter what this person has achieved. So then there is a sense of the need and the right to over-control. Sure, said Huberman. And now we're going to work together, right? So I'm exerting significant control over you, right? And it may be that he's not aware of it. In this case, said Andrew, it was a she. This woman, explained Conti, based entirely on Andrew's description of two emails, had allowed her unhealthy excess aggression to be eclipsing the generative drive. She required that Andrew bowed down before her in the service of the ego because she did not feel good about herself. This conversation extends for an extraordinary nine minutes, both men egging each other on, diagnosis after diagnosis, salient, perhaps, for reasons other than those the two identify. We learn that this person lacks gratitude, generative drive, and happiness. She suffers from envy, low pleasure drive, and general unhappiness. It would appear, at a distance, to be an elaborate fantasy of an insane woman built on a single behavior. At some point in time, a woman decided she did not want to work with a man who didn't show up. There is an argument to be made that it does not matter how a helpful podcaster conducts himself outside of the studio. A man unable to constrain his urges may still preach dopaminergic control to others. Morning sun remains salutary. The physiological sigh employed by this writer many times in the writing of this essay continues to affect calm. The large and growing distance between Andrew Huberman and the man he continues to be may not even matter to those who buy questionable products he has recommended and from which he will materially benefit or listeners who imagined a man in a white coat at work in Palo Alto. The people who definitively find the space between fantasy and reality to be a problem 
are women who fell for a podcaster who professed deep, sustained concern for their personal growth and who, in his skyrocketing influence, continued to project an image of earnest self-discovery. It is here, in the false belief of two minds in synchronicity and exploration, that deception leads to harm. They fear it will lead to more. There's so much pain, says Sarah, her voice breaking, feeling we had made mistakes. We hadn't been enough. We hadn't been communicating. By making these other women into the other, I hadn't really given space for their hurt and let it sink in with me that it was so similar to my own hurt. Three of the women on the group text met up in New York in February, and the group has only grown closer. On any given day, one of the five can go into an appointment and come back to 100 texts. Someone shared a Reddit thread in which a commenter claimed Huberman had a stable full of hose, and another responded, I hope he thinks of us more like Care Bears, at which point they assigned themselves Care Bear names. Him, you're the only girl I let come to my apartment, read a meme someone shared. Under it, was a yellow lab looking extremely skeptical. They regularly use Andrew's usual response to explicit photos, mmm, to comment on pictures of one another's pets. They are holding space for other women who might join. This group has radicalized me, Sarah tells me. There has been so much processing. They are planning a weekend together this summer. It could have been sad or bitter, says Eve. We didn't jump in as besties, but real friendships have been built. It has been, in a strange and unlikely way, quite a beautiful experience. Okay, New York Magazine article there on Andrew Huberman. That's it for me for this afternoon. Take care. Goodbye. Good Shabbos.